tonight. Good evening. The September 19th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Adjustment is called to order. Welcome. The first item of business is to take care of the postponement of items in Section 3, New Business, D2F. And I'll need a vote to take items out of order before we can. Is that a motion or just a vote? A motion. <laughs> uh, so moved. Second. Okay. Um, so, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. We'll vote to postpone items 3D through F, which includes 35 Whipple Court, 253 Broad Street, and 815 Lafayette Road. Is there a motion to do this? And that's to postpone it for one week? For, till next, till yes, ne till next Tuesday at the same time. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion on this at all? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Next item is approval of the August 15th, 2023 minutes. Does anybody have any comments? Jeff? Uh, yes, on page 12 uh, of those minutes, or 16 of our packet, uh, in, under the section decision of the board, uh, the, first, the first paragraph, uh, fourth sentence from the last, it says, he said it was spot zoning and it should say, he said it was similar to spot zoning. Okay. All right. Is there a motion to approve with this amendment? So moved. Okay, thank you. Second. Thank you. Okay, I have my people. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to abstain just because I wasn't there. Thanks. Okay, thank you. The next item is approval of the August 22nd, 2023 minutes. Mr. Matson. Yes, I have uh, on page eight of those minutes and 26 of our packet, um, the second, the last sentence of the second to last paragraph, it says, and he noted that the penthouse would not be visible to the other setbacks. And it should say uh, the penthouse would, uh, would be less visible due to the setbacks. Any other comments? Is there a motion to approve with this? Change. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? A abstain. Thanks. And one abstention. Okay. So we're starting with item B, and ML is going to sit in on this one. We will need an alternate for all of them, and both of you on one of them. I'll let you know. Okay. Are we doing the request for postponement first? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a request to postpone from the owner's look at 30 Parker Street. Whereas, anyway, there's a request to propone this, postpone this first item. How do you feel about that, Board? Uh, Madam Chair, yes. I will <laughs> move. Ram. I'll move to uh, grant the requested um, postponement for one month to the uh, October meeting that is currently scheduled on the 17th. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion on this? Just, I'll, ju yep. I'll just ahead. speak to my motion. Um, so uh, we've already postponed this once. Uh, there is some concerns from a uh, nearby uh, property owner. Um, the applicant certainly seems to be working hard to try and um, address those concerns. Um, you know, it's not a it's a shed and a, and a small porch, so hopefully uh, it shouldn't take uh, too much longer to uh, resolve those concerns. But um, I think the board can uh, provide a little bit of time to uh, to have a neighborly discourse to hopefully resolve those issues. Okay. Anything else? All right. I just want to yes, um, confirm with city staff: if something has been postponed twice, does it have to be re-noticed? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I do voice? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Now we are ready for item B, and ML, you'll be sitting in on this, please. B is the request of Cynthia Austin Smith and Peter Smith owners for property located at 9 Kent Street, whereas relief is needed to demolish the existing two living unit structure and construct a one living unit structure, which requires a variance from section 10.5 to 1 to allow a 
5,000 square feet of lot area where 7,500 square feet are required, and B, 5,000 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit where 7,500 square feet are required. Said property is located on Assessor Map 113, Lot 42, and lies within the General Residence A District, LU 23-119. This item was continued from August 22nd, 20, 2023 meeting to request more information from the applicant. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the no, board. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh. <laughs> sorry, just a point just of order. Just a little business, yeah. Um, we need to suspend the rules to reopen the public hearing in so, order to hear this tonight. Madam Chair, I would move that we uh, suspend the rules and uh, reopen the public hearing on this uh, case. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any to discussion? I'll just speak to my motion. Um, you know, we did um, go, we had some deliberation on this. Um, it is a, a complicated case. It was a long e night uh, when we were hearing uh, this item. Um, I think that there was some lack of clarity amongst uh, board members and uh, the postponement that we made gave us an opportunity to get more information um, from the applicant, but also in fairness, uh, really we want to make sure that we're not only hearing from the applicant, that we're hearing from the uh, other interested parties um, regarding this application. Ideally, uh, everyone understands the intent is, is to listen to new information that's been provided and any counter information to that new information, but uh, we'll see how things go, but it, in fairness, we, we need to hear all of that. Yes. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? No. And the second part of this is vote to accept the new information and hear presentation from the applicant. So this takes a separate motion. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Now it's your turn. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chairman, and, and thank to, um, to you and Stephanie because you dealt with what I was going to bring up first, which was <laughs> the motions you just made. Again, I'm Tim Phoenix from Hopeful Phoenix, Gormley and Roberts in Portsmouth. I'm here with and on behalf of Peter and Cynthia Smith, who are in the first row. Uh, also with me here tonight is Monica Kaiser, an attorney in my office, um, uh, who may kick me if I say something wrong. Jen Ramsey, who's done the design work, is in the first row. Uh, Robbie Woodburn, who's done the um, the uh, uh, landscape architecture, and John Shagnon, um, who's our engineer, uh, is out of town, but he should be on Zoom. Um, as you mentioned, uh, oh, before I get too far, I think this is going to be more than 15 minutes. Um, I would ask for 20 to start, and then if I'm not done then, then I can come back at the 2-4 against um, uh, time. Okay. Would the board like to make a motion allowing an extra five minutes? So moved. Five? Okay. Um, just so you know, um, we've, we've uh, struggled a little bit when we were here last time sorry, about the board I has. I want you oh, to sorry. Give a chance to make it ten. <laughs> okay. No. I Is there think. a second on this? I I'd second, second five. Okay. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. I got to learn you to stop proceed. talking over you people. Okay. Um, <laughs> the last time we were a little, if you will, unprepared for some of the issues of, you know, the board now has iPads or whatever they are. Um, so you were looking for the page in your packet where things were we didn't have it. Monica tells me that our, our memorandum and then all the subsequent exhibit, uh, exhibits start at page 40 of your packet, if that helps. We may refer to them as we go forward. Um, as you mentioned, it, this was continued from uh, uh, August 22nd. Um, we have a number of new exhibits um, that I will go through. Um, most of those are related to requests of the board for uh, answers to certain questions. Um, I will have, if necessary, Jen Ramsey and or John Shagnon and possibly the owners address things if, if we're dealing with questions about their plans that I can't answer. Um, I'm going to address the questions that the board asks and our response to them first. Uh, in most cases, we have referred to the exhibit that relates to the response. I am then going to go into just the, the improvements that we are proposing, uh, the purposes of zoning, and respond to some of the comments of, of board members last time. Um, turning to page two of my memo, uh, which is page 41 of your packet, uh, the first question is, what is the height as defined by the zoning ordinance of the structure to be demolished? <coughs> I believe you will find that as Exhibit K uh, in, our, in our submission, which is... 
should be at page 63. Um, so uh, what we did is we, we looked at both what's the elevation to the ridge, the sea level elevation to the ridge, and then from there, by determining the, the existing grade level, what the height is. And I can go into details, but if you look at Exhibit K, uh, it explains it, and the exi existing house is 31.14 um, feet uh, as measured to the center of the roof as required by your uh, ordinance. Um, so it is beneath the 35-foot limit. Number two, what is the height defined by the zoning ordinance of the proposed building? That gets a little bit more complicated because the ordinance has fairly recently changed. It used to be that the measurement was from uh, existing grade, and now the ordinance has been changed so it's from the lower of existing grade uh, or finished grade. As you know, we are proposing a garage under, which means we've got to you know, dig out uh, up to the foundation, which creates a big hole, and that had the effect of slightly reducing um, the um, uh, proposed grade because it's going to be uh, existing grade, um, uh, I mean, excuse me, proposed grade, um, and the average existing is 29.03. The average finished grade is slightly lower at 28.37 feet, and that's identified in Exhibit I in your package, packet. So um, starting from a distance of 28.37, uh, Jennifer um, has uh, an exhibit which identifies uh, the height from that, which includes the steps and what have you, and that height is um, 34 feet, um, 8 inches, or 34.67 feet, so it does meet the 35-foot uh, height requirements. Um, uh, as we summarize, as measured by the ordinance, the height of the proposed structure is slightly taller than the existing structure, um, but the sea level elevation at, at 66.73 is 0.82 feet, um, just under a foot less than the existing home, and lower than the Nicolaides home by roughly three feet. And you might ask, why is the new home taller than the existing, but lower than sea level? And it's based upon the way the ordinance measures height, which is midway to the roof. We've got a wide house now with a roof, and so the measurement is to here in my invisible roof line. And now we've got a narrower house, so the roof the length of the roof to get to the top is higher, so the midpoint is higher. Um, but it, it's still um, lower than the Michelides house next door and only slightly higher than uh, the existing home. You're going to see some images in a little bit um, that um, seem, may seem to show the existing home is taller. Um, there's a memo from Tangram who has done the um, renderings and the, the uh, streetscapes for us that explains that the reasons for that are that the, the proposed home is a little bit closer to the eye from the camera or the rendering, and also we're looking at the pitch of that roof at the very front of the house. So it's going to look a little taller because it's closer, and the house next door, the Nicolaides house, the gable end runs side to side, so the pitch of the, the, the roof ridge is 20 so or so feet back. So you've got one is here and one's here, so it looks a little bit, um, a little bit closer. It is not. Um, number three, why is the spa exempt from setback requirements? The short answer is that it is not. It's just that the spa requires a five-foot setback under the ordinance, and we're just a little bit more at 5.2 feet, so it did not need uh, any relief. And we have vetted the, all of this with the staff um, before coming here tonight. Um, number four, how will the garage be built? Um, um, the answer is the existing grade is between 25 and 28, so we're going to cut and, and dig a hole, if you will, to get down to the garage, the uh, garage level, which will be um, from elevation 25 down to 23. Um, so excavation is required to revise the grade from Rockland Street to the property, um, just as all driveways are. And again, that would be Exhibit H. Um, this document that Steph has up now is John Shagnon's work, which is there's two pages to it. Um, one is existing grade elevations. The next is uh, proposed, and then there's a summary uh, that demonstrates how we received to the height that I just recited to you. If you'd like John to address that, please let me know. Um, number five, is the applicant proposing to use city property to a greater degree than other um, residents? So, Jan, if you could go to uh, Exhibit H and page. Tim, do you know what page that, that's yes. on? Yeah. Um, 54, and it's plans page C2. So right there. So this is an image of the proposed home. 
you can see um, Rockland Street, and you can see the driveway coming off of it. But, I don't know if I know how to use this thing. So you can see the driveway coming off here. But the key is, and we understand why people ask the question as to whether we're using the park property. The fact is that Rockland Street um, runs all the way to the back of this lot. You can see the line here. It's only paved to here, but the street runs all the way back as depicted on this plan and in my memorandum on page uh, three, uh, five, which is packet page 44, you'll see that same image together with the original subdivision plan from 1899 that shows Rockland Street going to the end uh, and also um, another um, old uh, length, uh, um, plan part showing uh, the uh, street goes all the way to the end. So, so what we are doing is coming off of uh, Rockland Street pavement in the right of way uh, into our lawn, into our, uh, onto our lot and into our garage. And that's exactly what virtually every home in Portsmouth or any community does, because usually rights of way are between 40 and 60 feet, and usually the traveled portion of the way is 20 to 24. 24 is, is average in uh, 22, 24 and most. So almost every um, uh, lot access goes off the pavement onto city property and then onto your own property and into your garage. It's so. Um, the fact is we are not using any portion of the park for um, our um, uh, access, only the right-of-way. Uh, number six question was, what is the interior square footage of the proposed residence? Um, uh, with due respect to this board, um, and it's in our submission, um, we don't think that's before this board. Um, we think that the because the home is completely dimensionally requirement, and again, we vetted that with the staff, um, it needs no coverage, it needs no height, it needs no setback, it is completely compliant with respect um, to dimensional requirements and for that reason we believe strongly that that's not before this board. I'll get to that in a little more in, in a little bit. However, um, uh, because the question was asked on page 45 of your packet, page 6 of my submission, um, is the um, existing interior space is 3,561 square feet which is 577 uh, part of a finished basement, 1,013 first floor, 1114 second floor, and 857 in the third floor. Um, and according to the tax card, the existing is 2,176 square feet of living space, including uh, a 240 square foot um, attic space. Uh, number <coughs> seven is can you provide a survey plan that just shows the building envelope? I think this was Ms. Margison's um, uh, request or comment at the last hearing which makes sense and again if you look at that same page 54 you will see uh, made it more bold. Well, I, can't, I can't see it up there but I'm looking at page um, C2 which is on page 54 and you can see a, a relatively heavy dashed line that shows the existing building envelope um, there were some questions last time about the, um, the spa or the hot tub which we've explained um, and there, I think there was some question because there was a lot going on in the plan before. It was hard to find, find the, um, the setback lines, but they are shown. When I get close enough so my glasses work, I can see them. I trust that the board can see them or look in their packet uh, to find them. Um, so we've addressed that. Let's see. Um, can you provide a two-scale streetscape? Um, if you will, Steph, go to Exhibit L, which starts at page 85. Um, we have done streetscapes, which I'll get to in a minute, and we have done sort of isolated uh, photographs. Um, this first one um, is the proposed building. Um, from the uh, Rockland Street side, uh, you can see it uh, juxtaposed to the Michelides house behind it. And as I mentioned, it looks a little taller from here and closer and, and bigger because it's closer to the eye and uh, because of the roof pitch uh, being in the foreground. The next page um, is essentially from the other side, uh, which shows uh, the Michelides house and the one to the right of that, which are similar. They're both sort of wide front 
uh, wide houses fronting, but the gable end is side to side, um, which carries that roof line that I mentioned uh, backwards. Uh, the next photograph is uh, further down on Rockland Street, looking towards Kent Street and capturing uh, the yellow house, the Nicolaitis house, and our house. We submit that um, this is, it fits, it's in keeping. As I mentioned, um, our house is not as tall as the Nicolaitis house. Um, it is, we, we have increased the length, um, which I'll get to next. I'm not sure how these came out, but um, on mine, they came out pretty small. So again, this is um, a, a streetscape of Kent Street. You see our house on the end, which uh, you know I consider sort of, Much better. Thank you. Um, that's not the whole street, but you can see our house. I call it a, the bookend. I'd also like to point out that our house is, um, is somewhat uh, unique or um, unusually situated because we have tons of open space behind it with a park, tons of open space um, to the left side of it, down towards the, uh, the courts and the ball fields and, and, and what have you. Um, so there's lots of air, light, separation, and it's different than other ho most other houses uh, in that general area because it's one of the few that's on that corner facing those items, those, uh, those, uh, the park and the uh, ball fields and courts and what have you. Um, as you go down uh, uh, away from uh, Rockland uh, along the streetscape, you'll see a number of other houses. Um, one of them, um, the blue one, is kind of hidden by the trees, but it's good size. The white one at the next corner is quite large. And again, we, we believe this fits in well with the, uh, with the streetscape um, along, uh, in this case, along Kent Street. Um, the next one, uh, that's another one. This one's important because if you see that telephone pole, um, there's another image which shows it from an oblique angle, but this, that telephone pole is roughly at the point of a retaining wall between the Nicolaitis house and our house. And the existing house comes right about up to that telephone pole. It's about a foot, I think, as you know, half a foot to a foot off the property line, leaving very little uh, space between the existing house and the Nicolaitis house to the left. And this demonstrates that we are moving this house to be fully compliant with um, the, the uh, side setback, in fact, fully compliant with all zoning requirements, um, which creates a great deal more light and air. Uh, next one, please, Seth. Um, this one, if you can pump that one up a little bit. Oops, sorry. Uh, so this is the uh, Rockland streetscape. Um, Again, you see our house to the left. Uh, there's the yellow house across the street, um, uh, comparatively smaller, but there's a large garage, or a garage behind it that someone could fill in later. Um, and I'll get to the, 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 the law about that later. You can see that the White House there is quite large. Can you send it down a little bit? There you go. Thank you. Uh, that's back on. There we go. So it's a little hard to see, but um, you can see the, the brown house is uh, very large. It's sa shaped similar to ours. It's fairly long, but its gable end is facing Rockland, and its length runs along um, whatever street that is. Um, L1. Uh, L1, thank you. Then you know, there's that next white house, which is fairly good size. And as you go down Rockland, there's some uh, you know, quite good sized houses uh, along in there. Um, as a matter of fact, if you Um, turning to back, back to the, um, the, let me summarize. It was mentioned by one of the board members, it may have been the chair, that recognized that this whole area of Portsmouth is sort of evolving. Um, homes uh, are being taken down and larger homes are being built. We've got some photos of, of a couple. And um, uh, we think that the streetscape demonstrates that this house does fit in. And, I, and that is with starting with the position that the size of the house, its height, all other dimensional requirements um, are compliant and therefore the only issue before the board is whether to grant a variance and the effect of the variance given that the lot is 5,000 square feet where many in this area are 5,000 square feet um, and we don't meet um, the lot size nor the lot size per dwelling unit. However, I would point out that today there's a duplex on that lot and it's still 5,000 so 
there's the lot area per dwelling unit today is 2,500 square feet. We're doubling that to 5,000. We are today, if that, if the existing building was built today, they would need four off-street parking, which the property doesn't have. Um, um, so those cars of tenants are parking on the street. Let's call it four. We're going down to a single family. Two cars are needed. We're getting them both off the street. Um, a, a, a tenant of zoning is to get uh, properties closer to compliance. The lot size cannot comply. It can never comply. Uh, but the other improvements that we're making are, as I said, two family to one family. Um, we've got a half a foot roughly right side setback, which we're now going to be compliant. We've got a violating front setback, which is now going to be uh, compliant. We've got the four, the uh, two off street parking. Um, we've got the rear shed or garage, whatever you want to call it, that's inaccessible because of the slope there. Um, violates the rear and side uh, right side setback. That's going to be removed. Existing building coverage is 35%, and we're uh, reducing that to 25%. So on an overall basis, we're making things much better than they are. Um, turning to Exhibit M and number 9 um, of the questions from the board, the overall um, design scale and compatibility, we showed you the streetscapes. We would point out that 11 Elwyn Avenue, uh, we've given you several photographs, and several I've mentioned here, we don't have photographs, but done bullet items that show you know, where they are vis-a-vis um, our property. 11 Elwyn Ave is 80 feet long, 5 feet from the side lot line, 40% building coverage on a 5,000 square foot uh, lot. Um, um, there's a fence atop a, a concrete wall and it overlooks the park. Um, it's a stark contrast to ours, which is um, 12 feet from the lot lines, compliant, 56 feet long. And I'd also mention that there's been some concerns stated about the size of this house, and I'm assuming that may make the board believe that there's some issue with somebody's views. Well, people don't have a view. They don't have a right to a view. People argue that loss of a view diminishes their property value, but it is the variances that you can consider, not the home, not the project. It's where the variance for the lot that's too small, when all of them are and it can't be fixed, and the, and the lot size per dwelling unit is not met, but is doubled over what's there today. 84 Rockland Street is 58 feet long with 2,589 square feet of living space, not including uh, the basement. They've gotten variances for demolition, expansion, um, and uh, coverage, building coverage of 25 per 27%. 55 Kent Street is a long, narrow New Englander, 50 feet long, 22 feet wide. Um, and 10 and 18 uh, uh, are immediately across the street. Um, they have detached garages, and as, as I mentioned, the, there is the possibility that someone will take down those garages and expand those, um, those homes. And your ordinance, our ordinance, Portsmouth ordinance says that if you've got a non-conforming structure, you can expand it as long as the expansion is in a conforming manner. So theoretically, the Smiths could Condition on the existing house that's non-conforming in several ways, as long as it's conforming, as, long, as far back as they want, as long as they meet the, ver the requirements. And I submit to you that if you, can, if you can put an addition on an existing home and not come to this board because your, your, your addition complies, then you should be able to come and bring a brand new structure that fully complies with the dimensional requirements. Um, uh, we can go through those quickly. This is 31 Sherburn Avenue, which is quite large. Uh, go back one. The the, the one in, in keep going, keep going. Uh, the, the one that's in, in construction. You've got about 30 go seconds forward. left. Go oh, <laughs> sorry, Steph. He, go with the one that there's one that's being built. Attorney Phoenix, did you hear that? You're 30 seconds left. Oh, well, I'm nowhere near finished. So. I know. <laughs> so you can see this. <laughs> Going through the rest of these, the, they show large houses in the area, uh, and they also show, to Ms. Margerson's question last time, uh, a number of houses, a handful of houses with garages under, so it's not an unusual event. Um, that pretty much does it for my response to the questions that the board asked. I'm happy to answer questions. If you have questions that um, are related to Jen's plans um, or John's plans or Robbie's landscape plans, we be happy to try to answer them now. Otherwise, I'll sit down, but I will come back and address the other issues that I wanted to address because they relate to uh, appliance of your ordinance and appliance of the law to this particular application. Are there questions? I, yes. they, oh, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I think that um, 
you know, some of the, you know, you're talking about how the square footage of this house is not before this board. I think perhaps some of our questions were misconstrued. Uh, it was sort of a heated hearing. Some, a lot of our questions were just clarifying. We couldn't really understand the project. So I think, you know, there was a certain sort of defensiveness, I think, in the memo. And <laughs> I, I just, or combativeness, perhaps. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, some of them were really just questions, just so you know. No, we respect it. No, I appreciate it. We're, I mean, we try to be professional. And if some frustration came out, that blame that on me. But uh, to, to fully answer your question, Ms. Margison, when we were here before, we didn't expect any questions to come up about the height of the building, the width of the building, the length of the building, or any dimensional requirements because they're not before you. Those issues and other issues related to constructability will happen during building permit. That's why you don't have detailed plans regarding sections and what have you because we didn't need a variance from those. We only need a variance for the size of the lot and, and 5,000 square feet where 7,500 square feet would be required. So that's why we were, if you will, stumbling a little bit with your questions last time because we didn't think that was going to come up. Maybe we should have anticipated, but we've tried to sort of hone in on that to, to answer your questions now. They were fair questions under the circumstances. Uh, understood. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak in favor of this petition? Good evening, board. Uh, my name's Adam George. I reside at 134 Lincoln Avenue. My family and I have been proud residents of Portsmouth for the past 14 years, with the last seven years spent in this very neighborhood. This place we call home is truly remarkable, enriched with wonderful people, amenities, and its desirable location. Having come from Australia, I couldn't imagine raising my family anywhere else. During this time here, I've witnessed the gradual evolution of our neighbourhood and town. While many changes have been tasteful in keeping with the spirit of our community, others have left us with questions about the direction in which we are heading. In our neighbourhood particularly, we have seen a surge in renovations, extensions and modern projects as both new and long-standing neighbours recognise the value and of their homes and strive to adapt them to meet their modern family needs. I'd like to echo the sentiments of Chairwoman Eldridge, who spoke in the previous board meeting. I would say that of all the neighbourhoods in the town, I think this is one of the fastest changing neighbourhoods. There have been enormous homes built on Elwyn, and this just isn't whatever neighbourhood you're picturing. Because this is a very quickly changing neighbourhood, Ms Eldridge's observation accurately captures the vibrancy of our neighbourhood. I understand the overarching concern shared by the board and the public alike, which is to preserve the charm that makes Portsmouth so special. We all hold this sentiment dear, and it's essential that we remain respectful of this shared goal. I, support, I supported the original proposal put forth by the Smiths and respect the board's decision to reject their plan based on the concerns raised by both the public and the board alike. In response to these constructive criticisms, criticism, sorry, the Smiths have diligently gone back to the drawing board to design a house that addresses the original concerns. The revised proposal, one, conforms to all structural ordinances and only requires a variance for the non-conforming lot size. Two, it clearly is recognisable as a New, New Englander with a modern aesthetic. And three, will further improve the overall neighbourhood. In light of these efforts and the direction provided by the Zoning Board of Adjustment, I implore the board to carefully consider the facts outlined and allow this revised proposal to move forward. By doing so, we can strike a balance between preserving the character of our neighbourhood and welcoming thoughtful, modern updates that ensure the, the vitality of our, uh, for future generations. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. I do want to remind the speakers that you have five minutes when you come up. Is there anyone else to speak in favour of this petition? Good evening. Hello. evening. Uh, thanks for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak in favor of the project at 9 Kent Street. I'm Kevin O'Connell and have lived at 140 Elwyn Avenue for the last 15 years. During that time, I've seen many renovations and reconstructions of homes in the Little Harbor neighborhood. This project being similar in scope to a number of projects that have been approved by this and previous boards. 
The owners are asking to rebuild a home on a lot which is non-conforming by current standards. At a previous meeting, it was requested by this board to present a plan that complied with current, current ordinances. <clears throat> it was stated that the owner could build a glass box as long as it conformed. The owners complied with this request, provided a plan for a fully conforming home, and still a motion was made to deny the request. The ever-changing target set by this board not only harms these homeowners, but any homeowner owner in this neighborhood wishing to build or renovate a home in the future. Homeowners should not have to wonder whether costly architectural and engineering plans that comply with ordinances will be denied, be denied by the zoning board. I believe the board should approve this plan as presented. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else to speak in favor? <laughs> I have three pages, so I'm going to try to talk really fast. <laughs> my name is Jessica Kaiser. I live on 30 Spring Street, and I've had the pleasure of uh, calling Portsmouth my home for two decades. As I mentioned in a previous meeting, I own several properties here in Portsmouth, and I've stood many times in this room listening to the decisions from the ZBA and the Historic Committee. And I've taken a keen interest in the challenges the Smiths have faced as they seek to build a new home for themselves and their two boys. We all know that Cynthia and Peter originally sought multiple variances for the development of their home, which was quickly opposed by neighbors and denied by the board. I sit in on that meeting, and I ultimately understood why the project didn't pass. But the Smiths have now gone back to the drawing board and have developed a building plan that is in full compliance with Port Portsmouth building regulations. In fact, that's commendable since most new builds and, new and many renovations seek relief with multiple variances. The only remaining challenge the Smiths face is the fact that their lot is 5,000 square feet where 7,500 is required. That being said, all but three lots in the Elwood neighborhood are less than 7,500 square feet. So it's not unreasonable to ask relief given that almost every lot faces the same challenge. And in fact, I can cite three lots under 7,500 square feet approved for new construction in the neighborhood. 24 Kent Street was, for, was a 4,800 square foot undeveloped lot, which received approval for a new construction. 21 Elwyn was an unmerged 10,000 square foot lot, which was divided into two 5,000 square foot lots. One of those lots was an entirely new build, which received three variances for the lot size, for an HVAC pad, and, three, and street frontage. Lastly, another non-conforming El Elwyn lot was subdivided into a very small 3,000 square foot lot on Sherburn Ave, and three variances, ran, excuse me, variances were granted for lot size, for 31% building coverage, and for a rear, rear yard setback. So then I take a step back and I say, okay, let's look closely at the four parameters that guide the ZBA's decision to grant approval for various requests. One, granting the variance would not be contrary to public interest. In fact, the construction of this new home would enhance, most public, would enhance the public interest in the following ways. The Smiths are reducing density by replacing a two-family with a single family. They're adding off-street parking for two vehicles while, existing home, while the existing home has none. They're replacing a non-conforming structure, which currently has 35% building coverage, 50 feet of zero lot line coverage, front side and backyard setback incursion. And they're replacing all of that with a 100% conforming structure. This is in public interest. Denying the request would likely result in a lawsuit at the expense of the Portsmouth taxpayers, and denial is contrary to public interest. Two, granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. Being fully compliant with all structural ordinances is in the spirit of Portsmouth regulations. The lot already has a building with greater coverage, so it's clearly buildable, and therefore replacing that with an even smaller structure is in the spirit of the ordinance. Three, granting the re Granting the variance would not diminish the values of surrounding properties. I think many people would collectively agree that any neighboring house located next to a beautiful single family New England home with a modern twist would incur more value than if that same neighboring house was located next to a rundown, outdated, multifamily property with transient tenants. Four, is the variance request due to an unnecessary hardship? I don't believe this question comes into play in this situation since the Smiths are no longer requesting any exceptional variances specific to the property. The lot is 5,000 square feet, similar to almost every other lot in the neighborhood, and that condition cannot be remedied. In previous communications, the ZBA clearly instructed the Smiths to build a structure in full compliance, which they have done. Now they simply ask to be granted a variance for the size of their lot, which has been granted multiple times to other families undergoing new construction. Simply put, the Smiths did not the Smiths did ask exactly what you asked them to do, so we see no problem moving forward. In closing, I'm not here because I personally care whether or not Cynthia or Peter gain the right to build their family home. I'm here because they deserve it. 
They have taken every step to understand the guidelines required to comply with Portsmouth Building Regulations. They've listened to your feedback as well as the complaints of their neighbors. And as a result, they have gone back to the drawing board and adjusted their plans to ensure they are fully in full compliance. The situation that the Smiths face has become a topic of great conversation within our community. We all believe that the decision to approve the development of this home should not be based on politics or personal preference. We don't care if an ex-mayor or even the governor stands in opposition to this project. The city has put clear building guidelines in place and the Smiths were able to comply with every requirement except the one they cannot control, the size of their lot. The ZBA has actively approved other new construction projects under 7,500 square feet within the Elwyn neighborhood and I ask that the Smiths be granted the same fair and equitable approval for their project as well. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this petition? Excuse me? There are some online, but I think we will do the public hearing in the room before we we can't tell if it if they're for or we against, no, so we take right. them at the so end. So we're going to take okay. them at the end when two for or against is the rule. Is there anyone to speak in opposition to this petition? Hey, thank you again. As the only director butter, thank you for the opportunity to address the uh, proposed redevelopment in I Kent Street. For simple brevity, I'm going to go to criteria number two and tell you why I am opposed or we are opposed to this. Criteria number two is the spirit of the ordinance observed. It is not. The applicant has reverse engineered a proposed redevelopment to the maximum extent possible to build the largest possible home on an undersized lot. In doing this, it appears that they still require dimensional relief for exceeding the 25% building lot coverage and for both rear and side yard setbacks for which they haven't requested from this board. In their supplemental memorandum dated uh, December 11th to this board on page three, they state that the city staff have determined that the spa, hot tub, is an accessory structure. Pursuant to Portsmouth Zoning Ordinance 10.573.10, an accessory structure less than 10 feet tall and less than 100 feet square feet in area must be set back five feet from any lot line. The applicant concludes by stating, lastly, as discussed supra, the spa is treated as an accessory structure. Pursuant to section 10.574 of the Portsmouth Zoning Ordinance, all accessory buildings and structures shall be included in the computation of building lot coverage. It is not. Look on sheet C2, the plan labeled variance plan, which is page 54 of your, uh, in your packet, the 96 square foot spa area is not included in the proposed building coverage. If it was, the proposed building coverage would now increase to 27%, requiring a variance. Go to drawing G2, label proposed ground average grading plan, which should be page 58. The elevation of the back patio deck against the rear of the proposed home is 28.9 feet. It also clearly states that the average patio deck elevation is 28.8 feet. The elevation is also confirmed on their landscape plan. Now go to the northeast corner of the patio on the landscape plan and you will see the letters BW, bottom of wall, which stands for bottom of wall and the elevation is 27.1. 28.9 minus 27.1 is 1.8 feet, which is over 21 inches. The patio is above 18 inches in elevation. Nothing has changed. This means that both the section of the patio and the masonry wall are greater than 18 inches above the existing grade. Portions of the patio should count towards building lot coverage, while sections of the masonry wall now require both rear and side yard setbacks. On page six of the applicant supplemental memorandum, it states that the city staff have further confirmed that the landscape walls in the Kent and Rockland Street front yards under 18 inches in height are not structures. The applicant goes to great detail providing top of wall and bottom of wall elevations along the entire front yard landscape, 17 sets of elevations. However, when you go to the back, there's absolutely one bottom of wall elevation of 27.1 and no top of wall elevation for their six foot high masonry wall. One can only deduce that masonry wall is actually seven feet, nine inches and a half high. Is there any re renderings that show the view from the park? 
Does an almost eight foot high masonry wall require planning board approval? Is this in the spirit of the ordinance? The applicant also knows that section 10.513.13 states that fences over six feet in height require both side and, yard, uh, side and rear yard setbacks. In their March submittal that was denied, they requested dimensional relief for this. Yet it appears that they forgot to do it this time. It is the same backyard, nothing has changed. So how is this proposed to redevelopment in the spirit of the ordinance? When they require dimensional relief for exceeding their 25% building lot coverage due to their spa, patio, and masonry wall being omitted from their calculations in their masonry wall along both the rear and side yards requiring setbacks. Again, nothing has changed from their earlier submittal. How could this possibly meet the spirit of the ordinance? Criteria number one, the variances will be contrary to the public interest. In last month's submittal, the applicant states, there is absolutely no harm to any neighbor or the general public from gr granting the lot size variance. This is not true. The proposed redevelopment alters the essential character of the neighborhood by significantly altering the air, light, and the visual environment for the general public using Seltz Mill Pond Complex. On page two of the supplemental memorandum dated September 11th, the applicant goes into extensive detail explaining the peak height of the existing home, but more importantly, determining the height of the existing house is defined by the ordinance as 31.14 feet height. For a two and a half story building that is 32 feet long and 31 feet high, the surface area or the billboard face of the facade facing South Mill Pond is 818 square feet. The applicant then states that the proposed new home has dormers nestled in the gabled roof so that the measured height to the midpoint of those dormers results in a zoning height of 34.57 feet, an increase of three and a half feet. The proposed surface area of the facade facing the public for the top three stories of a full height building that is 56 feet long is now over 1,941 square feet. How does a 230% increase in the surface area of a home facing the public at South Mill Pond not affect air, light, and the visual environment? This calculation doesn't even include the full height basement that is now visible. If it did, it would be a 300% increase in surface area. The photographs and the applicant submission show this. There are no step downs in the roof. It is the only full height four story building along Rockland Street facing the public. And because it extends three feet closer to Kent Street than any other home, it obscures the visual environment along Kent Street as well. The applicant lists numerous homes and compares their overall design, scale, and compatibility with the neighborhood. Almost all of these homes are not complete teardowns. The other new construction in the area are in scale and respectful to the neighborhood. One of the purposes of the zoning ordinance, section 10.121.5, is a preservation and enhancement of the visual environment, and this does the exact opposite. It clearly runs contrary to the public interest. In the May 16th Board of Adjustment meeting minutes, their attorney states, the applicant was required to do a stormwater plan to document pre and post construction. Is this not required now? The roof line orientation is changing from east, west to north, south. The concrete foundation for their new home increases substantially in length from 34 to 56 feet and they're now constructing a seven foot deep, uh, uh, seven, uh, the foundation is seven foot deep and an impervious barrier created by their six foot high masonry wall with a four foot deep footer buried continues 28 feet along the property line. There now exists an 82 foot long impervious barrier along a 100 foot property line that affects roof runoff and stormwater that now has no place to go. On the other side of these impervious barriers, the undersized lots in pervious surface areas increasing from 36.5% to 57.8% according to their drawings. Their own test pit, labeled test pit one, under the patio states that the estimated seasonal high water table is only two and a half feet below grade. Now that they're covering the entire backyard with an impervious patio surface, where's the water going? When you look at their proposed drainage and grading plan on plan C3, their proposed curb cut along Rockland Street extension for their driveway is the lowest point, where all the stormwater will now flow down Rockland Street, down their driveway, into the garage at elevation 23 feet, which is the lowest point. We just had two to three inches of rain last night. Where's all the stormwater going? Will there be under drains or a sump pump? Where are they pumping it to? They provide no details of grading or elevations between our yards. Wouldn't it be, have been prudent to submit a stormwater plan? 
Isn't this in the public interest? And finally, criteria number uh, four, denial of the variance results in an unnecessary hardship. The applicant, in their own words, describes our property as a side-by-side -side duplex with no driveway or off-street parking. The board voted unanimously several months ago against the applicant's project for many reasons, one of which was their inability to prove a hardship. Nothing has changed. The applicant moved the house over 12 feet, but it's still the same four-story full-height house, patio, spa, and masonry walls. There are no special conditions, and it doesn't result in a hardship. The applicant knew that what they were buying when they purchased the house. Is a house without an underground garage considered a hardship? The underground garage allows for the expansive patio spa area that still requires dimensional relief. Five of the six homes with, with under house garages that the applicant provided photographs of are modest one to two story homes. Only the garages are not subterranean, they're all at street level. In summary, on page nine of the applicant's supplemental memorandum titled part two, supplemental legal announcement A. The applicant politely reminds the board that the scope of the ZBA's review is limited. Yet the applicant's recent submission once again proves that their proposed redevelopment is contrary to the public interest. Their submittal is not in the spirit of the ordinance because it required dimensional relief for ex exceeding their building lot coverage. They require, um, and due to their spa, patio, masonry walls, and that they require both rear and side yard setbacks for which they haven't asked approval for. And finally, it is clear that there are no special conditions and it doesn't result in a hardship. Enforcing the ordinances for which they have not requested dimensional relief and setbacks is in no way overstepping your authority. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else to speak in opposition? There'll be time later. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman, board members, Jim Lee, 520 Sagamore Avenue. So, as you know, in order for a variance application to fail, it, has, it only has to meet to not qualify for one of, of the five criteria. In my opinion, this application fails on number five. It says, literal enforcement of the provisions of this ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. For the purpose of this subparagraph, unnecessary hardship means that owing to special conditions of the property that distinguish it from other properties in the area, no fair and substantial relationship between the general public purposes of the ordinance provision and the specific application of that provision of the property and that the proposed use is a reasonable one. If the criteria in subparagraph A are not established, an unnecessary hardship will be deemed to exist if and only if Owing to special conditions of the property that distinguish it from other properties in the area, the property cannot be reasonably used in strict conformance with the ordinance and a variance is therefore necessary to enable a reasonable use. You know, the property is there, it's available to use now. I believe that's a reasonable use. I think uh, tearing this property down and building another property would be an unreasonable use of that property. Things like, uh, in whether this is uh, in conformance to the ordinance or not, applica things like this are exactly the things that are driving the price of homes in Portsmouth to an average sales price now of $981,000 and pricing a lot of residents and their children out of the uh, ability to live in this, neighbor in this town they grew up in. So I would submit to you that this application fails on number five, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in opposition to this proposal? Uh, good evening. Uh, Bill Arakian, 18 Kent Street. Um, I'd like to start by discussing real estate values. In the latest submittal, there's numerous examples presented concerning surrounding homes and values, and I realize this can be subjective, but I'd like to focus on one example the proposal specifically references, uh, which is closest to 9 Kent Street, and that's 11 Elwyn. I agree with the applicant that 11 Elwyn is a great example, but for different reasons. Uh, a few comments about 11 Elwyn. This property was a renovation of an existing structure. 
Uh, it actually came before this committee with an existing footprint requiring little in the ways of exemptions. However, abutters had concerns regarding the scale and potential impact to their properties regarding light and air, and this board, as some of you may remember, asked the applicant to revisit their proposal. To the credit of the applicant, they came back with a modified proposal, which is the home you see today. It was a great example of the board addressing neighbors' concerns and after some give and take, ending up with a proposal that satisfied everyone. I would contend that real estate values of those abutters were not impacted due to the good work of this board to limit construction and ensure that the mass and scale of the renovation did not negatively impact neighbors and their property values. Unfortunately, what I see with this current proposal is a structure whose mass goes well beyond any of the referenced examples, including 11 l one This design is clearly working the numbers backwards to construct the largest rectangular box possible to be just within the ordinance. This proposal for all new construction whose scale, mass, and location impacts abutters and the public negatively, uh, what transpired at 11 l one was a good example of give and take between the applicant, the abutters, and the board that resulted in a positive outcome. I've not seen that from 9 Kent Street. Since the application refers to street perspectives as skewed because of, quote, an illusion caused by perspective, I'll reference some numbers as those are not illusions. Uh, the mass, scale, and impact of this project is considerable. It takes one of the largest existing homes on Kent Street today at 2,176 square feet of living space and replaces it with a structure of 3,561 feet. That's a 64% increase. It takes an existing home whose footprint has a depth of 30 feet and replaces it with a new structure 56 feet in length, almost double. While billed as a two-story home, the proposed living space would be four stories. The first story has a basement level garage, living space close to level with Rockland, and not just garage doors, but additional windows and access doors. This is not strictly a subterranean basement. Then add to that a second story, then a third story, then a fourth story, complete with full dormers on both sides, running almost the length of the 56 foot long building. Almost all properties in the area are much smaller in scale and have stepped down heights, making them much less impactful to views and abutters. The sheer scale of this project will have a negative impact on abutters, impacting light and air, and runs contrary to the public interest, not just for the abutters, but for those who enjoy the bordering public park. Um, I'd like to discuss a few areas of the proposal that I feel need addressing on the latest submittal regarding compliance. Um, a few of these, I believe Mr. Michelletti already touched on, but um, first of the cement walls that encircle the property. On page six, section seven of the applicant submittal, they refer to the cement wall along Kent and Rockland Street as, quote, landscape walls, and since they're under 18 inches in height, are excluded as, quote, structures. But somehow, as these walls turn the corner towards the abutter in Langdon Park, they're no longer walls. They become, quote, fence walls, quote, end quote, that adhere to six-foot fence restrictions. To be clear, there are no fences along the abutter or Langdon Park, just cement walls that extend up to six feet in height. A cement wall, as referenced along Kent Street and Rockland, continues to be a cement wall and therefore a structure in the back and side yard. And since the cement walls are obviously well over 18 inches along the abutter in Langdon Park, they should be considered structures included in coverage and require a variance. Continuing on coverage, I'd like to focus on building coverage ordinance currently at its maximum value of 25%. The applicant clearly states in section three of their responses, the spy unit is an accessory structure. And according to the Portsmouth Zoning Ordinance 10.574, all accessory buildings and structures shall be included in the computation of building coverage. In the latest variance on C2, it shows the accessory structure is not considered in the building coverage calculation, and its inclusion would result in building coverage being out of compliance. Additionally, looking at the patio grades, I approached it a little differently than Mr. Micheletti did, but we ended up with in the same place. I looked at the average grade worksheets for east of property that contain the patio. The existing grade sheet has an average of 28.29. The proposed grade sheet has an average of 30.34 for a difference of 2.05, 24.6 inches, well above the 18 inch maximum limit to avoid a variance. For the above reasons of real estate value, public interest, spirit of the ordinance, and numerous omissions and errors in the submittal that bypass necessary variances, I would ask the board to deny the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else to speak in opposition?
Good evening. I am Cliff Hodgson, and I'm still living at 10 Kent Street. The proposed structure does seem to meet all the setbacks, but it's still a very long, large, tall building clashing with the character of the surrounding neighborhood and location. All other recent construction and additions in the area have done well to fit in with the houses and properties around it. But this modern design is in sharp conflict with all of them, as well as looming over the surrounding parks. The sheer size and scope of this design is driven by choices. There is no hardship here. And why is it so complicated of an answer for how tall a structure actually is compared to others in the vicinity? The roof of a two-story house at the top of Union Street could be higher above sea level than the rooftop of a house on Kent Street, but that doesn't make it physically taller than my two-and-a-half-story house. It was interesting to see photos of other homes in the area, but some of the information accompanying several of them is highly misleading. Even Exhibit O does not mention that the approved additions to the house at number 11 Elwin Ave were utilizing the footprint of the existing structure, which needed much physical attention inside and out. The owners of the home listened to the concerns of the neighbors and the zoning board and actually scaled back their plans. The house at number 21 was vacant and being totally renovated at the same time as number 11, and number 27 had been a vacant lot until 2020. So, of course, there were no negative impacts on the property values by that renovated house on the corner of Elwin Ave, which had been there for over 100 years. The revitalized home blends in with the character of the area homes, as do number 21 and 27. I could cite other examples included in the packet, but we are here to discuss number 9 Kent Street, not to be distracted with what the other neighbors have done or may want to do in the future. Let's focus. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else to speak in opposition? Barbara Adams, <clears throat> 75 Kent Street. I'm here to talk about the revision for number nine Kent Street. The project has now been revised with many photos of other houses in Portsmouth that seem to be similar to this but none of those are actually on Kent Street. The issues remain the same. The lot area is the same. The percentage of lot coverage they propose is still increased by the same amount, 36.5% to 57% coverage. And thirdly, the claim of hardship, which I believe was denied at the first ZBA meeting, has not changed. There is no proof of additional hardship. The owners bought this house and property knowing full well what it was and its restrictions. There is a section of this revision uh, that was just proposed, presented, that states that this project observes the spirit of the ordinance and it is not contrary to public interest. I disagree. In that regard, I would cite the Portsmouth Master Plan under the heading Urban Neighborhoods. The Portsmouth Master Plan states, the city has embraced historic district zoning and, more recently, character-based zoning to ensure compatibility of new development with historic areas of the city. And under that, 2.1.1 is to implement standards and guidelines to protect community character and assets, including factors such as mass and scale. And 2.1.3, residential zoning standards should ensure integrity of existing neighborhood development patterns. The master plan was written for a reason. We do understand that it is not an enforceable mandate, and we all respect that we are not within the boundaries of the historic district. However, we are an historic area of the city with houses built starting in 1900. I will state again, I believe this project would alter the essential character of the Kent Street neighborhood. And finally, approval of this project sets a precedent for the future in Portsmouth for others to buy small lots and develop them by maximizing to the absolute minimum the size and height of their proposal while disregarding the effect 
on, neighbor, on existing neighborhood. We have already seen it in places all over Portsmouth. It should not happen again on Kent Street. I have to wonder how many times neighbors need to come forward to say this. I wish that this would be denied. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in opposition to this petition? <coughs> Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. And first and foremost, one of the reasons I think everyone has done a nice job of speaking, um, I just really want to thank you for opening up the public hearing, um, Madam Chairman. I, I know um, we had a conversation, and I really appreciate that you did that um, so people could have an opportunity. There's five questions you have to ask, and if it doesn't meet one of them, then it's denied. And I think people have given you a good rationale an understanding of why they feel it should be denied. Again, this is everyone's property because it overlooks a major park, but I hope you do the right thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in opposition? Okay, then I think we will go to our Zoom comment. Go ahead. One more, and then we're going to open this to the Zoom people who have been waiting. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. I just rule of thumb, two, four, against, and that's usually when I speak and, and close all this, but that's fine. Um, so good evening. Uh, Rick Beck said 1395 Lisbon Street. Again, just as the last speaker said, I think the community uh, appreciates the fact that they were able to go and, I guess, give their uh, concerns one more time to the board before ultimately tonight and you will be making a decision. Um, I guess the best way to go and put it is simply the fact of the hardship and the essential character. And I know that some board members will go and say the essential character isn't necessarily something that we could go and take under advisement. We'd probably end up being sued. It would go to court and we'd lose. But it's in your rules. It's in your mandate. And if it has never been challenged, I challenge this board to challenge it, to be able to see if it's something that actually is done. Because what is happening? Two things. We all talk about adding more housing to our stock, lessens the prices. You have before you tonight a demolition. Now, I know they go and they say that it's two variances as far as the size of the building and the size of the lot, but you also have, when you read it in the public, when they read it, is, is to demolish, to demo a building, another one. And that is within your purview. And I've seen this board go and say it time and time again. How do you justify demolishing a building? And you had some time ago, and it's been brought up before, on Essex Ave in Portsmouth, not far from my home, where a home was purchased for less than $500,000, was demolished. And a two and a half ended up being a three and change because it depends on hill and raise. And this does loom over one of the two buildings that it now resides on, looms over an existing building. It's there. We've done it. It also has an adverse effect that I will continue to go and press on, is that home was purchased for a half a million dollars. That land now is worth more than a half a million dollars. And when that happens in a city anywhere in this country, it has an adverse effect because it raises the value of each of the existing homes that are around there, the land, automatically, just like that. And there's no turning back from it. That's raising it. That's making us place unaffordable by demolishing these buildings. And it's happening time and time and time again. Most of the homes that are there in this neighborhood have been renovated. I have personally renovated many a home in Portsmouth. This is a multifamily that's gonna get turned into a single family. It can't be allowed. It shouldn't be allowed. The board should stand on its actions before that there was no hardship because that's exactly what is in front of you tonight. But again, I challenge you. The, the, the essential character, it's in your guidelines. Use it. I've heard some of you speak of it before and then scare off because we're not really sure if we can go and challenge it in court. I'm telling you right now, if it's in our bylaws, if it's in your rules and your regulations, the court is going to side with the municipality that has those rules in place. Please deny this application. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to go to the people who've been waiting to zoom in on our meeting in the two, for or against. 
part of the public hearing. I apologize if I um, mispronounce any of these names, but Jeff Hodges, um, if you can take yourself off of mute and introduce yeah, yourself. Can you guys Hi. Can you, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go right ahead. Oh, great. Uh, that, yeah, this is Jeff Hodges, and I, I live at 112 Lincoln Avenue, uh, right around the corner from the property. Uh, I'm very grateful that this process exists, and I appreciate having the opportunity to speak today uh, in support of the project. Um, our family absolutely loves this neighborhood and the distinct characteristic that it holds. Uh, there's a reason it's one of the most sought after neighborhoods in all of New Hampshire. Uh, we, we walk past this property on a daily basis, so this project will have a direct impact on our day to day reality. Um, after seeing the renderings, uh, I really think it will be an elegant addition to the community. And I appreciate and empathize with my fellow neighbors who may not favor the design and are reluctant to see this change happen. But once it's built, I genuinely hope we can all come together to admire the new home and welcome our new neighbors as a community. Um, I've had the opportunity to review all the materials from the last meeting, including watching it in its entirety, uh, because watching archive zoning board meetings is what I call fun. Um, this sparked a genuine curiosity of uh, what, what exactly is in the ordinance, so I read that. Um, I've learned a lot, and in no way, shape, or form am I an expert, nor do I want to suggest anything of the sort. Uh, but it is good to know that the scope and detail set forth regarding building guidelines in Portsmouth is right there. Uh, as a property owner, the, property owner in the community, I, I may need to engage this process for my own home one day, and it's nice knowing that the rules are spelled out in black and white. So after reviewing all of this, I'm a bit confused about the process and why we're still here. Excuse me, can this you, excuse me, can you speak strange. up a little bit, Mr. Hodges? Yeah, um, uh, uh, yeah. so after reviewing uh, uh, all of this, I, I'm a bit confused as to why we're still here. Uh, this seems to be a fairly straightforward approval. Now, I'm saying that based on my understanding that the new designs fully conform with all of the technical guidelines set forth in the ordinance other than the size of the lot. My understanding of that is based on the fact that no other variants are being requested. And as was indicated in the last meeting, that staff agrees that none of the technical designs require a variance. So what is being requested is the approval to build a fully conforming house on a non-conforming lot. Allowing a property owner to build a fully conforming house on their non-conforming lot is not contrary to the public interest. Some may have preferred the old structure, some may prefer the new structure, but to base a denial uh, on being contrary to the public interest because of changes to the air, light, and visual environments seems extremely dubious and fraught with legal challenge, particularly when that structure fits within the published size guidelines of the ordinance. There also seems to be quite a bit of shaming of the property owners wanting to build a larger house with amenities. This seems completely unfair and outside the remit of this board's authority. Once again, the home being proposed fully conforms to the technical size guidelines set forth in the ordinance. I don't think it's this committee's place to tell property owners they've gotten too big for their britches. If the precedent is being set that a size of new construction on non-conforming property will be limited based on some proportional size to the previous structure or lot size, then these criteria need to be explicitly spelled out in the ordinance for the benefit of all non-conforming property owners. Furthermore, many projects increasing the size of previous house have been approved. How are you going to pick the winners from the losers when fully conforming house designs are requested with or requesting a similar variance? Public shaming is not in the spirit of the ordinance, but height, size, and setback requirements are. This proposal meets all of those criteria. I was somewhat surprised during the last meeting that a motion to deny was raised based on it being contrary to the public interest because of its size and that it may diminish the property values of the neighborhood. Again, the size conforms to the size limits in the ordinance. How can a conforming house be contrary to the public interest? If that's the case, then the current size guidelines need to be reduced. And suggesting it would diminish property values is wildly speculative and unsubstantiated. I can't think of a single new home build or renovation in the Little Harbor area that hurts surrounding property values. And I'm sure there were similar objections raised on those projects beforehand in this very room. A denial may actually diminish surrounding property values because there seem to be a lot of non-conforming lots in the neighborhood 
and all future property buyers will be put on notice that this board may unilaterally deny a fully conforming rebuild. I request that this board set aside any personal or political pressures, pre-existing biases, and vote yes on this legally straightforward variance, allow the property owners to build their fully conforming house on the property they own. Thank you. Thank you. We have another Zoom person. Aaron Prue, please um, take yourself off of mute and introduce yourself to the board. Hi, this is Aaron Prue from 99 Marn Avenue. And I just wanna say thank you to all of the board members for hearing public comment. I'm going to keep mine short because I know this has been a long night, um, but I do want to speak in support of this application. And in speaking in support of the application, my primary reason for doing so has already been stated by multiple people who spoke before me to speak in support. Um, essentially, the reason that I'm in support of this application is for the fact that this new application now is meeting all of the guidelines and the only variance being sought is the size, uh, is the fact that it's a non-conforming lot. The fact that the house is fully conforming, um, I, I don't feel the based on what I've seen approved in the past in Portsmouth and in the neighborhood, I don't feel it would make sense. And I guess it's a little confusing why it would be debated. Um, I do completely understand the fact that it is a different style. It's a more modern style. And that's just the direction things are headed in. It's not the historic district and people are allowed to choose the style of their home. Um, speaking also from the question about property values, that I, it sounds like there's been arguments both ways. Um, the fact that property values might be might decline because of because of a home like this going in. I can speak with experience that the property values will increase in the neighborhood with this change. Uh, the reason for that is the fact that it's going to be pushed further away from the existing home that it sits next to, and it's also going to be an improvement in terms of. Um, the existing duplex that sits on the lot currently is just a little bit more run down. Um, you're going to have a nice new house in the neighborhood that will increase the values in the neighborhood. I think there was others that were speaking about this being a bad thing, that values are increasing. It's, that's just because of where we live. We all live in this wonderful place and values are going to increase. Uh, keeping it a duplex to try to keep the value down just seems a little odd to me. Um, so uh, I will, I'll stop now and I just wanna thank you guys again. I know this is um, difficult and I appreciate you hearing everybody out. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak to, for or against? Sure. <laughs> um, just quickly in reaction to some of the statements that were made here, I, I first wanna be clear that the Smiths have taken extensive steps to make sure that this was reviewed obviously by their engineer and their architect and that was brought forth to City Hall where the personnel fully has reviewed everything to make sure that the structure that they're proposing is fully compliant. Um, I'm kind of taken aback that we as citizens think that we can interpret the plans in our own way and then fight here at, against the zoning board saying that it's not actually compliant. I think we need to trust in the personnel at City Hall to make that decision. Um, additionally, uh, design is not a conversation. Again, this is compliant from end to end. We are not in the historic district. And as once, one gentleman once said, they could build a glass box if they truly wanted to, as long as it sat within the parameters set forth by Portsmouth regulations. So we as individuals and citizens don't have a right to say whether you can build a glass structure, something with turrets or paint it pink. They have every right. and their preferences should not decide whether or not we move forward with this decision. Lastly, the variance that's on the table today has nothing to do with the structure itself. So the structure itself isn't even a conversation to be had. The only thing that we should be deciding right now is whether or not they have a right to, put a, to build on a 5,000 foot lot, square foot lot, that should have been a 7,500 square foot lot. And we put plenty of information in front of you guys to say that this has been granted multiple times in the past even for structures that did not have full compliance and needed additional variances. So I just wanna clarify that everybody who has very personal preferences or personal opinions about how this property should be built, it has nothing to do 
with the conversation we're having today for the square footage in place. So I just want to make sure you introduced yourself before you started. I am anything. Jessica Kaiser. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. Two for or against? <laughs> yeah, David Michaelitis, uh, the, the abutter at uh, 19 Kent Street. Um, so can we sh show these drawings? How about our drawing C2? And let, so let, let's show the facts that this is not a compliant plan set. I'm a retired professional engineer in civil. I can read drawings. Please show up C2 so we can tell Jessica what the facts are. No, I think we're finished. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else speak two, four, against? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I didn't hear what happened with General Mitchell. We're Nicolai. not showing any more photos. Oh, from okay. The um, so um, my experts are going to address, because there's been some allegations made about the contents of the plans and, and what have you, um, I would start by saying I don't know that in 40 years I've ever heard an abutter say I'm upset because a project's going to increase the value of my property. I, I just don't see that happening. Uh, secondly, there was an allegation that we're over the lot coverage with a Turning, uh, re relating to page C2 on page 54 of your packet, um, the SPA is included in the 25 percent. Moreover, under the definition of building coverage, structures less than 18 inches above ground are excluded. So for both of those reasons, the staff properly found, and therefore we did not request a variance for the SPA or the um, patio. Um, with respect to um, the, the, the stone enclosures, uh, the fronts are less than 18 inches, so it doesn't apply anyway. The rear, the staff considered it a fence, which is also excluded. So we proceeded before this board um, with the understanding of the uh, relief that we needed, which has been mentioned, and I thank, thank them, by a number of uh, the abutters in support um, uh, as uh, fully compliant. Um, that fact can't be overlooked. Um, there was some talk uh, last time by board members about um, it's an expansion of a, of a non-conforming use, and that is simply uh, not the case. Um, use in your ordinance is, is, is set forth in, in Section 4 of the ordinance. I'm looking at Section 10.440 of the Table of Uses. Single-family dwellings are a permitted use in the residential zone. So we have a single-family dwelling. So there's no expansion of a non-conforming use. There is a variance requested for a non-conforming lot. Turning to the hardship, um, this lot um, is smaller than the ordinance requires, and that cannot be fixed. That in itself is a hardship. The, the, the statutory provision talks about comparing to other homes in the neighborhood. It is true that there are a number, many other 5,000 square foot lots in this neighborhood, but if you include the larger neighborhood, this lot, which has existed for 120 years, uh, has always been this size and, ex and can't be changed. It, is, it also has special conditions because of its location. It is located on a corner where there's a large open area behind it and a large open area uh, next to it. Uh, many of the homes do not have that, and that creates special conditions. In fact, it's been mentioned by those in opposition that the, the people can see this house from, from, from the park or the courts or whatever, and that's true. I think we have done an excellent job, or my experts have, of identifying um, how this house fits in with the neighborhood. We've identified a number of other large homes in the neighborhood, large homes that have more coverage, more length um, th than this home. Um, there was some talk last time about it violates the public interest um, or diminishes um, property values. Not, again, not the variance we're requesting. The issue is what is the effect of the variance for lot size and lot size per dwelling unit? I'm repeating, so forgive me, but we're improving by um, 100 percent, or is it 50 percent? Going from 50 percent anyway, going from two families to one family, improving parking. Um, General Nicolaides mentioned air, light, et cetera. Well, we've created a lot of air, light, uh, and space between our houses for, for his benefit. The, as some of the members have stated and we have stressed um, both in our presentation and in our submission, the, si the size of the house, the height of the house, the distance of the house from lot lines are not before this board. 
They are, we are compliant with zoning, and there is no basis for this board to insert its decision. For instance, if, if the, this lot owned all of the park behind it, this house could go right where it is with nobody saying anything. If we, we've, there's been a lot of talk in town about tiny houses, 500 square foot homes. If we put a 500 square foot home on this lot, we would need identical the relief that we need today. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude by look, uh, asking the board to consider the non-conforming statute, the non-conforming lot provisions. Section 10.311 says, any lot that has less than the minimum lot area or street frontage, not applicable here, is non-conforming and no use or structure shall be established unless it's granted a variance from the applicable requirements of this ordinance, the applicable requirements. The only applicable requirement here is the need for a variance because of the lot size and lot size per dwelling unit. There's no applicable ordinance requirements relating to the home itself that are before you. Turning to non-conforming buildings, a lawful non-conforming building or structure may continue and be maintained or repaired, but may not be extended reconstructed or enlarged unless such extension, reconstruction, or enlargement conforms to all of the regulations of this district. Now, we don't, we have a lot of non-conforming building now and a non-conforming structure, but that's going to be gone. And I submit to you that if you can expand a non-conforming structure in a conforming way, then you can take down a non-conforming structure and build a completely conforming uh, structure on the lot. And to find otherwise is a violation of uh, this, this applicant's rights. Um, I'm going to turn it over um, to others, but we've outlined the ways in which we meet the re rest of the requirements for variance in our original submission. I won't repeat them here unless the board wants me to because we addressed it in writing and then we addressed it ver you know, in, in a presentation a month or so ago. So um, I'll turn it over to that to, to, to my others to address the specific allegations. And the last thing I'm going to say is um, it's a little tough. I know some people are lay, lay persons. I didn't know that General Michelides was an engineer, but people make allegations about things that are happening, and there's no expert testimony. There's no plans to back them up. They just make the allegation without consideration of the fact that we've been through this before. We heard the board. We met with the staff multiple times to make sure we were getting this right in terms of the variances we needed. That's all I have unless you have questions for me. No. Two, for, or against? Hello, Bill Araki in 18 Kent Street. Uh, just a couple quick points. Um, I guess I wouldn't consider them allegations. We're just going by the proposal that's been put forth uh, by the applicant. Um, and within that proposal, there's certain aspects that appear to be fairly clear cut and that the zoning ordinance 10.574 clearly states all accessory buildings and structures shall be included in the computation of building coverage. And it's within their application that they call the accessory spa an accessory structure. Therefore, it should be included. And on their C2 proposal, that's not shown. As, uh, and if you do the calculations, it's not included in that coverage calculation. And then regarding offense, um, within the application, it refers to the front walls as landscape walls, the side and back walls as fence walls. Therefore, on the front, they're saying that it's a structure, but it's not, doesn't have to abide by any of those variances because it's less than 18 inches. The very same wall on the side and the back is not a structure because it's no longer a wall, it becomes a fence, even though it's the same thing. And I did, um, you know, within the ordinances, there's very few references to fencing. Um, there's only one in the Portsmouth ordinance that refers to fencing as wood, metal, and chain link. Um, nowhere is it discussed as cement. The only cement referral within the ordinances refused, refers to enclosures of dumpsters. Um, and I would contend that the way the application spells it out for the shorter walls on the front is correct. And that same criteria should be applied for the walls on the side and the rear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Two, for, or against? You may. <laughs> thank you. Robbie Woodburn from Woodburn and Company. I'm the landscape architect. I just want to clarify a few things in terms of fences, fences, walls, structures, and grades. Um, in the rear yard on the patio, if you can um, show L. Um, L1, L1, L? I'm sorry. Okay, all right. 
on that plan, and you can look at your, your plan in the packet, there is at the bottom of the steps coming out of the residence on the patio, there's a spot grade of 28.8. That's at the bottom of the steps. That patio pitches to the east towards the fence wall um, so that it is lower in that corner where uh, General McGillides called out the fact that it was higher than 18 inches. It is not higher than 18 inches. That grade at that point um, above the, the bottom of the wall, 27.1, is the existing grade at that point. And on top of the patio that's above that, it's 17 inches above that because it pitches from the 28.8 towards that corner. We were really very careful with those grades. We may not have enough spot grades on here to make it overly clear, but keep in mind, when we build this and we get our building permit, we have to meet all of these criteria that we've had on here. So um, the, um, the six foot high wall, the six foot high will be great, will be um, measured from existing grades, so it will be qualified as a fence. We specifically went to planning to talk about what this structure would be, whether it be a fence or a wall, could we do it in concrete because it's kind of a modern garden. Um, and if it was six feet or lower, from the existing grade, then it qualified as a fence. That's planning's um, interpretation of the regulations. That's all we can do is ask the question and design to that. The wall slash fence along the front and side will not be higher than four feet. It'll be a combination of a wall that is less than 18 inches plus the, the fence material on top of it that you saw in the rendering. So the total height will be less than four feet, which is what the uh, regulation is for uh, fences in the front and side yard. Um, it will have a wall on the bottom and then the remainder of it will be fenced. So it is a fence and it is a wall and is not counted as a structure because the wall portion of it is less than 18 inches high. So that's that. The spa, if you look at C2 and you look at the, the previous uh, chart, previous impervious chart on the upper left hand corner, you'll see that the spa is indeed included in those, cal those calculations. Um, there was mention about the drainage and the drainage from the garage. Um, you, you may remember in the original um, package we had a drain that connected and uh, went to a new catch basin that assisted the drainage in the park. That, uh, that unfortunately did not make it onto the engineer's drawings. We're still going to do that. So we're not getting drainage and nobody's going to design something to have drainage to go into the ground, garage. We've got a drain. So I think I've addressed most of those questions about what would have put, up, put us out of compliance? We actually are in compliance. We sat with staff multiple times to make sure that when we did this, it would be in compliance. And that's why we're only asking for the variances we are. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Two, for or against? Hello again, Cliff Hodgson here, again from 10 Kent Street. Um, I don't have anything prepared on this particular notice, but seeing as though we just found out that they're having this big drainage system still in the plans, but they didn't bother to put it on the diagrams, the one that sends uh, the water down through the park and down to a drain by the tennis courts, is this the same one they're talking about? And if so, who's gonna pay for digging this big trench that goes down the hill through the park and down to the corner of the tennis courts. That's what it was originally proposed or suggested. And I'm wondering, is this the same plan they're talking about right now? Because that wasn't on the, pro on the proposals here. So that's something you may want to consider. Who's going to pay for this? Is this the system? And is this really something you want to have them do? Thank you. OK, thank you. Two for or against? I promise I'll be less than a minute. Okay. Um, just wanted to mention, I didn't mention before drainage. Um, I mentioned it in general in terms of what was provided to the board. Um, that that, those calculations were provided last time because of the nature of the project. We are decreasing from 35 to 25 percent the, the uh, impervious, co the coverage, building coverage on the lot. So that's going to create more lot for drainage. drainage. Where's the water going to go? Well, right now it goes off this house and it, it's zero, almost zero feet from the Michelides house. Um, so there will be areas for treatment. I'll let Robbie uh, address the drainage. But those issues, in general, are not, bef 
not only tonight, but in general, are not before a zoning board. You're looking at this lot size. We will have to comply with all the requirements, meet with the, uh, the um, uh, building department, and provide uh, detailed plans that will be reviewed, fully vetted by the appropriate representatives and employees of the, of the city of Portsmouth, and we will have to comply with all city requirements. Um, if we don't, we would have to come back here. But today, you're talking about the size of this lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to close the public comment session now, but we'll keep the public hearing open in case the board has questions for any of you during our deliberations, given this is a controversial and complicated project. Okay, so it is now back to us. I think I would just okay. I think I would just ask for clarification because I think that um, if we are closing the public hearing, then we can't. I mean, we are closing public comment, but not the public hearing. And this is a recommendation from staff. Yeah. So my recommendation would be to close the public comment and but keep the hearing open so that you can ask questions of the applicant if you wish to. If there are no questions by the board for the applicant, then you can. Go ahead and close the public hearing and get to your deliberation. If you think you might want to do that, this is the only way one could do that. Uh, I do have a question for Attorney Phoenix. Uh, and a lot of the, uh, I actually don't think it's a very complicated application because I agree with you that we're here to consider the 5,000 square foot lot size and much of the other things that have been brought up or maybe not as relevant. Uh, however, the one question that I think makes it controversial is this <clears throat> this idea of the essential character of the neighborhood and whether or not this particular structure would be consistent with the essential character. Could you just speak to how you define essential character and how you think about sure, that? Sure, sure. The essential character of the locality or the neighborhood, along with each of the other <clears throat> variance requirements relates to the variance you need, not the project you're doing. So the question is whether or not a 5,000 square foot lot with a duplex on it, which, which is 2,500 square feet per dwelling unit, which we're going to improve to 5,000 square feet, and we're also going to improve the parking, we're going to improve the setback, we're going to improve the coverage, it's whether the lot and the variance for the lot changes the essential character of the neighborhood or violates any of the others, not the building. As I keep saying, with due respect, the size of the building, its location, its look is not before you because it's compliant with zoning. And as one of the, one of the um, uh, people who spoke, uh, I think it was the gentleman who spoke, um, uh, maybe the last gentleman who spoke uh, online, uh, mentioned, if you find otherwise, you put zoning on its ear because nobody can rely upon anything that's in the zoning ordinance. And we come here relying upon what your ordinance provides for dimensional requirements. And since we complied, that's not an issue that this board considers for character of the neighborhood or anything else, only the lot and its size. That's my response. Thank you. Okay. Discussion? Motion? Back to us. Point of order. I guess I'm confused about public hearing being closed and can we do, do discussion? Do we have to close the public hearing to do discussion or it's what? Apparently not. I'm trying to understand what city staff's recommendation is. Mm. My confused. recommendation was to close the public comment portion yeah. but not to close the public hearing um, in the event that the board would like to ask questions. Sure. If you're looking to enter the deliberation and make a motion, I would suggest closing the public hearing. Right. But if we are discussing... If, if you are asking questions, 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 keep it open, but deliberations, um, the public comment, or I'm sorry, the public hearing should be closed during deliberations. Okay. Are there questions at this point? If not, we can go ahead and close. Okay, if you're confident, this is it. The public hearing is closed. Okay. All right. 12. 
I'll, I'll start okay. first. Mr. Uh, Rossi. I was one of the board members who talked about expansion of a non-conforming use, and when I went back and read the minutes, Oh, really? That's usually not a problem for me. I must well, be forced tonight. tonight. <laughs> I was one of the board members who uh, brought up the concept of expansion of nonconforming use during the last uh, discussion. And when I went back and reviewed the, the minutes, I realized that my logic was incorrect. So at this point in time, even though I was not in favor of uh, or was not supportive of the variance request at the last meeting, uh, my position is changing because I do agree that uh, the logic that Attorney Phoenix has put forward is more compelling than uh, what I had been thinking uh, a, a, a few weeks ago. Mr. Matson. Uh, yes, um, I just uh, regarding the uh, unnecessary hardship. Uh, uh, the issue before was because there was more variances being asked for. Um, the I, uh, for me, for specifically, for example, didn't see an unnecessary hardship to need to build within the side yard setback, um, since that is no longer being a variance asked for. Um, not seeing the unnecessary hardship for that is now irrelevant, um, because the only thing is whether or not the um, lot size that they can't change is an unnecessary hardship. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. So I, I think that this is a, a somewhat complicated, in some ways it's a very straightforward application, in some ways it's a somewhat complicated application. I guess I, I don't find Attorney Phoenix's view of the essential um, character of the locale so, so narrowly, um, and I'm not sure if by granting these variances we are not um, violating the spirit and intent of the ordinance in terms of the essential locality of the, the of the central character of the locality. Um, countervailing that is that in almost all respects, the, um, the application actually improves the conformity with the zoning ordinance in terms of like the right yard setbacks, the rear yard setbacks. Um, the building coverage does actually decrease to meet the zoning ordinance. Um, so I, it, you know, I, I think that I think it's a little bit tough. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure which way I'm going to go, I'll be honest, because I do think that um, there might be a problem with the spirit and intent, not with air and light. Um, I'm persuaded that air and light is fine. This is a, uh, this is a corner lot. Um, and there, this, all the other setbacks are actually uh, in conformity. So that's just my thoughts and looking forward to hearing Thank other you. members. Thank you. Anybody else? A motion? Oh. Oh. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so there's certainly been a, a lot of discussion, um, a lot of good points. Um, I, I come back to really what is, is relevant to this board, and I think that's an important consideration here. Um, traditionally, a request of this sort has always been interpreted by this board as a request of, is this a buildable lot? Um, there's essentially this 50 by 100 lot is there's about uh, 25 other lots in this direct neighborhood in this original subdivision that are either the same size or actually even slightly smaller. There's some uh, 50 by 85s over on uh, Lincoln Avenue. There's a few, there's a number of others that are just slightly larger. Um, all of them have had buildings placed on them. Um, some of them, as has been noted by some of, uh, some of the speakers tonight, have been you know, relatively recent. Um, where um, the fact that this was a uh, sub substandard size lot um, was not an impediment to uh, those lots being developed. Um, there's, there's other aspects here that, that certainly poke at, at lots of issues. Um, first is, is, as we talked about, the demolition of an existing structure. Uh, I'm personally, I'm disheartened um, by the trend, as many of the speakers have talked about tonight, but across our city, not just in this neighborhood, but across our city, we are seeing the fact that the um, value of the land beneath our buildings is, um, in many cases, you know, of, of a greater intrinsic value, maybe not true total value, but intrinsic value to, um, to someone who wishes to purchase that land than, than the structures that are on it. And that, that is, I fully agree, is, going, is a, uh, something that's gonna change the characteristics of our city. Um, I think it's concerning. Um, 
but is it something that this board has has true purview over? Um, you know, we do have, as um, you know, former Mayor Beckstead talked about in the last meeting, uh, there is a there is a relief that we have in place, the demolition committee, uh, which is a uh, an opportunity to say, hey, this this particular property shouldn't be subject to demolition. This pro this building shouldn't be subject to demolition, and you bring it before that that group, um, and they can take a look at it. As former Mayor Beckstead also noted last week. That, that board is very limited, that committee is very limited in its powers. Um, we are you know, subject to whatever allowances there are at the state level of what they give us to be able to control things. And demolition outside of historic districts is extremely limited. Um, the idea is, is it's your property, you bought it, you can do what you want with it um, in terms of demolition. Uh, but nonetheless, that is an outlet that we have in the city to go and try and address those types of concerns, and certainly one that I would say, if that is a, a concern, um, should should be addressed here. You know, bigger picture, this whole issue of you know property values is something that, again, legislatively needs to be be looked at, considered. Uh, whatever can be done at a city level can can be done. It, it may actually require state level action because I just don't think we've ever seen. Um, this type of a strange situation, at least in my experience in New Hampshire, where you we now like created so much value in the in the actual land itself. Um, so I, I do think that's an important point, but one that's not directly applicable to uh, what we're looking at here. Um, in terms of essential character of the neighborhood, um, you know, I'm the one I I talk about that an awful lot. I do think it's extremely pertinent, but I do also think it's tied back to the actual relief that's being asked for here. And again, what's being asked for here is, is this a buildable lot? Um, I thought, um, you know, in the last meeting we had uh, Attorney uh, McCallum with his experience um, in, in these matters, basically advised the board that he thought that actually we were under an obligation to approve it, but he did bring up a novel idea, which is that, but maybe we should say that the height of the structure is something that we could limit um, based off of the essential character of the neighborhood. And I did t try and take a close look at that, and, and I do think some of the information that was provided by the applicant is kind of helpful in, in looking at that. Um, is this, you know, could, so could we say that these substandard lots, because they're only 5,000 square feet and not the 7,500 square feet required by the zoning ordinance, could we say that um, there's a characteristic of the neighborhood that there's a whole bunch of much smaller homes that are on, existing on those small lots that says that really the characteristic is, yep, they're smaller lots, but you know what? They also hold, have smaller homes all around them. And that's the reason why we go and say something to the effect of, yes, you can make a building on this substandard lot, but it has to be in conformance with a, a lower standard than what the zoning ordinance would normally require. Now, I do know that the applicant's attorney has kind of argued against that point and said that that's, that's not, not allowed. I would disagree with that. I do think that if we could establish a pattern through the neighborhood, that that would be something that we could uh, potentially enforce. That said, looking around the neighborhood, looking at what is being proposed here, I mean, the true actual height of the, the building, and I know our, we have a very convoluted um, height requirement uh, in, our, in our zoning ordinance. I'm sure there's an architectural reasons for, for defining building height the way that we define it. But the actual physical height of the building is um, somewhat, you know, somewhat less than what is, is in the existing height is probably somewhat less than is of, you know, sort of the adjoining property and other properties in the neighborhood. I did walk around the neighborhood, um, drove around it, tried to really assess like, you know, what kinds of structures are there. And really there, there are other buildings that are, if maybe not the exact same height, are, are awfully close. And to be able to say that, you know, we have this characteristic of the neighborhood that somehow we should limit the height of the structure based off of that, um, I just don't think we can do it. I, you, know, you know, the height of the, the structure as defined in the zoning ordinance is being negatively impacted by the, um, the dormers that are being placed on it. And I do kind of agree with some of the comments that have been made. Um, I think the dormering on the park side is probably, you know, appropriate. We do have some other examples of one-sided dormers, certainly in other parts of the city. Some examples in this neighborhood, probably not quite as large as this. Um, but you would expect because you're trying to soak in that, that view of the water, of the park, et cetera, that the, that the height, the fenestration on that side of the building is probably going to want to take advantage of all those sorts of things. I think the full size dormer on the other side is a bit much, but at the same point in time, can I say that it is so much that we can't say that 
you're building within the envelope that's allowed by our uh, zoning ordinance. Should we reduce you down because you're asking for this real large dormer? I, I just don't think we can go um, quite that far. Um, I, you know, I don't like it, but I also think that our zoning ordinance, which protects us in many ways, but is not perfect, um, doesn't really fully protect us. Um, you know, protect the the uh, ability to uh, make that dormering on that side of the house. So, with with that and this this basic concept of oh, and the one other thing I want to say is you know there were some arguments about you know what's a fence, what's a, what height is this, the the spa. I, I'm personally I'm looking at the proposed building coverage. I think they missed the spa as well. I'm kind of in that camp. But you know what? We're gonna if we do the, approve this, we're gonna approve the allowable 25%. It's up to the applicant to figure out. If in fact that that was missed in the calculation, either they lose the spa or they lose something else in, in their in their plan. They're getting 25% is what they get. Um, and if there is concerns about the interpretation of some of the uh, requirements by city staff, again, there's another outlet there that can be done to go and address those, which is to make an appeal of a decision by an administrative official. And um, you know, it can either work indirectly, but if it came to it, that's another uh, avenue that uh, that someone has to again come before this board and say, you know, I think they interpreted this. I understand that you gave uh, the leeway to go and construct this, but I think we're misinterpreting these aspects of the zoning ordinance. So with that, I I just don't think there's enough here to say that this somehow isn't meeting the essential characteristics of the neighborhood in terms of the zoning relief that's being asked for in this application. In the last application, we had lots of, lots of uh, things that were asked for, very little that was being given back. In this case, we have very little that's actually being asked for in terms of is this a buildable lot? Uh, can you construct a, a home within the, the framework that's allowed by our zoning ordinance, which maybe it's a little too high for this neighborhood, uh, maybe not, but it is what is defined for this neighborhood, and I just don't see enough of a, a defining characteristic surrounding it to say that we, we can't uh, go and grant what the uh, applicant is asking for. Those are my thoughts. Just comments, Duncan. Anybody else? I mean, I have seen uh, in New Jersey, you know, where I moved up from a number of years ago, this phenomenon of the land, especially along the shore, uh, becoming so much more valuable than the homes that had been built there many decades ago. And it is true, the nature of the housing stock is going to change mm -hmm. unless there are changes made to the zoning ordinance itself that will prevent that. Uh, that's clearly outside of the purview of this uh, board of adjustment. Uh, but if it is something that uh, the, those who live in the neighborhood would like to pursue, there are ways to pursue it, recognizing that they would then, you know, henceforth have to live under those same restrictions, uh, and that would be fair. So there are ways to do it, but not in a timely fashion for this application. A motion, anybody? Uh, Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to um, approve the application as uh, presented and advertised. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, I, and I gave a pretty long soliloquy already on some of my thoughts. And again, I, I have a lot of empathy for what has been brought forward by the neighbors. I think a lot of it is correct uh, by other members of the public. I think a lot of it is there, there's some truth there. That said, I mean, I think we have a, a very good zoning ordinance. I don't think it's, it's infallible. Um, it doesn't always give us the exact result that maybe we thought that that it would, that it gave us for our neighborhood. At the same point in time, as a as a building as an owner, um, it also gives you certain rights and, and the ability to do certain things with your property. It's always a trade off uh, between between the you know the needs of the of the property owner and the needs of the surrounding uh, neighborhood, and you know that that's just the nature of, of what we're looking at here. And again, we have very specific criteria that we need to go by, and I just think that. Um, based off of what's being asked for, um, it's meeting it. So uh, granting the variance would not be contrary to the uh, public interest and granting the variance would be observe the spirit of the ordinance. Again, going back to the essential characters of the neighborhood, I think I kind of explained, again, specific to what is being asked for here for relief. I can't say that the applicant is not meeting that, that aspect of 
essential characters of the neighbor, na characteristics of the neighborhood. There is a lot of large structures on these substandard 5,000 square foot lots. The, that lot size is found through, you know, through a good portion of the neighborhood. Um, some that are slightly larger, but still with still substantial size homes on them. Some of them with uh, high roof lines, with dorm rings, some other, some of the other characteristics that we're seeing in this, this home. Um, and, and again, there's, you know, the, the particular window placements and whatnot, we just, we simply can't go that far. We're not the historic district. We don't give that kind of back and forth to an applicant to say, well, we really don't like the amount of windows that you have here. That's why the HDC has multiple work sessions to get through it all, to, you know, truly get the opinions and impressions from, from lots of people on those very specific details. We just don't. Um, Granting the variance would do substantial justice. Um, again, that's a that's a balancing test, and again, specific to what is being asked for here for relief in terms of is this a buildable lot? I do think the applicant, you know, and by demonstration of the overall characteristics of a what is already currently there, and b what is available on similar lots throughout the neighborhood, what they're asking for it, it falls in the uh, in the balance to the to the applicant. They are asking for something that has been granted to many others. Um, you know, in the past, in some cases, in, in the recent past. Um, so I don't think there's any other substantial um, characteristic that's been put forward um, with regard to, um, to you know, competing concerns that, that outweighs uh, that fundamental right to develop your property in compliance with the ordinance. Um, granting the variance would not diminish the values of surrounding properties. Um, I, you know, again, we've had some, some discussion, but essentially, um, I, this structure, um, again, a newer structure replacing um, the existing two-family, admittedly losing total number of, um, of dwelling units, but generally, um, you know, being a more conforming building, um, it, it's not a, a different use that would somehow go and, and reduce the value of the, of the uh, nearby neighborhoods. It is a single family is allowed in this area, and uh, with the overall you know, general characteristics of the property um, would doubtful that it would um, diminish the value of the surrounding properties. And then a little enforcement of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. So there are a few things, um, few things here. Again, I think one of the essential hardship aspects of this is that is it a buildable lot? Um, there's numerous other lots in, in the neighborhood that are of a similar substandard size. So it was set up that way. Uh, when the first subdivision was put together back in, as we see in like the 1890s or so, um, it was um, has a, a current structure on it and has had has successfully had a structure on it for many many years. Was being proposed here is now a fully conforming structure um, on a on a lot that is of a characteristic size uh, to the neighborhood, even though it is somewhat below um, the requirements for. Uh, the zoning uh, that is applied in general to this neighborhood. Um, and basically there's just, with, with that, there's no general uh, public purposes of the ordinance that say that this specific home shouldn't be built. We talked a little bit about some of the height concepts. Um, I do kind of think that, I, I fully agree with what's being said, that they're sort of maxing out the height, especially on the side approaching their neighbors. But at the same point in time, there's not enough there to say that that is out of the nature of, uh, of other uses of, of these 5,000 square foot lots on other properties uh, in this area or even maybe throughout the city. Um, so therefore, I believe it's reasonable. And um, uh, with that, I recommend approval. Okay, does the second have anything to add? Uh, I would just like to add that there's ample evidence that granting the variance, in fact, would not diminish the value of the surrounding properties, just to underscore the point that was made by a number of people okay. any more discussion I'm definitely going to be supporting this um, motion I feel like the hardship is the land and the family couldn't build a dog house there without needing a variance and the fact that they have decided to build up to the allowable dimensions is completely legitimate and um, therefore I don't see any reason to deny this? Are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ms. Geffert. I vote in favor. Yes. Mr. Mannell. No. Ms. Marchison. No. Mr. Rayum. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair votes yes.
Thank you very much. You are approved. <clears throat> I'm going to take a break. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, there's been a request for a five-minute break. break. <laughs> <laughs>
We are back in session. And the next item of business is C. The request of Caleb E. Ginsburg and Samantha L. Ginsburg, owners for property located at 303 Bartlett Street, whereas relief is needed to demolish the existing detached garage and construct an addition with attached garage, which requires a variance from section 10.521 to allow seven foot left yard where 10 feet is required, a two foot right yard where 10 feet is required, C, building coverage of 27.5% where 25% is allowed, and two, variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming structure or building to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on Assessor Map 162, Lot 13, and lies within the General Residence A District. Is there anyone to speak to this petition? Good evening, Chair Eldridge, Hello. members of the board, Monica Kaiser from Hopeful Phoenix, Gormley and Roberts. Um, with me tonight um, is Samantha Ginsburg. Caleb is on Zoom. He's got the baby at home. Um, where did Donna go? Oh, she's in the restroom. And Peter and Donna Splain are the direct butters. They are also part of this application because it, it's a precursor to some lot line adjustment issues. Um, I just want to get out of the way. First of all, I think there's about seven letters of support from the neighbors um, around the area. And if you look at it's page 113 of your packet. We've given you an exhibit that shows the property and then all the surrounding uh, mm -hmm. abutters who are in support of the project. Um, I don't think they spoke to the creek, but they spoke uh, to the creek club, but they spoke to everybody else. So um, with me tonight, in addition to the homeowners, is Alex Ross from Ross Engineering. He's done the survey uh, and technical work. Um, Charlie Hoyt, I believe, is on Zoom. Um, Charlie had to pick up his son from the airport today um, and so is joining us by Zoom. I do have a written statement from him that I'll, um, that I'll hand you and you can pass around. You don't need to look at it unless you have a, a question, but Steph will give you one and then. Thanks. Um, you wanna take one and pass it or you can pass it oh, okay. We'll pass. Thank you. Whatever you want. <laughs> Chair Eldridge, I, I don't know if I should ask for more time to present. I can't imagine anything less enticing to all of us than staying too long. But I do just want to put out there that there is there is a twist to this application because there is some uh, lot anomalies um, that I think will add a little time to my proposal. So you if you don't. What? You want to play it safe? And play it safe with an extra five minutes. How okay. about that? Is there a motion to allow an extra five minutes for this application? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Go ahead. So just to start with, this is a regular house on Bartlett Street. You drive by it all the time on your way out of town. Um, it's developed with a single family home with a ten, uh, 1,085 square foot footprint. It's got a detached 251 square foot garage. Um, and basically, and it's got a big deck in the back. So is this, okay. So I want on the existing conditions plan, I just wanna draw your attention to a couple things. Namely the garage here that already exists, this big deck area here, um, and also this little side porch right here. I just want you to keep those in mind as I continue on talking and when we get to the proposed. The sum and substance of the proposal is that we're, um, we're gonna take this garage down um, and we're gonna build a new garage, but we're gonna move it a little bit forward, which will make the driveway a little shorter, pull up some asphalt, and then we're gonna connect it to the house <coughs> in place of where this deck is. So you see that there's deck here, that's obviously all covered um, and so it'll be just sort of like an l-shaped addition onto the back of the house it's a single car garage it will have living space above it um, 
but that's the upshot of the proposal. What's interesting about this case, and I can tell you Caleb and Samantha are not, they would prefer that it wasn't this interesting, but here's what was interesting about it, is that if you look on page 96 of your packet, um, and also in your staff memo, you'll see a representation of what the tax map says this property looks like, a little L shape. Um, but that's actually <laughs> not what the deeded property was. So while your tax map shows the deeded property to basically be all of this, the deeded property to Caleb and Samantha is only this rectangle here. And the deeded property to the splines <coughs> is only this rectangle here. In fact, this whole T-shape in the middle um, is owned by somebody else or was owned by somebody else. And it just was never caught. It was a deed error probably back in the 60s um, and was never picked up. Fortunately for both property owners and their predecessors, <clears throat> uh, the tax assessor was sort of accurately describing the size of their respective lots, but pictorially, the visual led one to believe that they owned more than they did. And that primarily the visual was in Caleb and Samantha's favor. But of course, when they decided to come up with some plans to expand and they commissioned a survey, um, there was a big uh-oh moment. It's taken us some time to resolve that, but we tracked down the heirs to this T-shaped property um, and they have conveyed that property um, to, <clears throat> to the Splains and to the Ginsburgs. So the plan now is then to adjust the property line to make this whole T-shape go away and apportion parts of it to either property. Um, and in conjunction with that, that would probably just require planning board approval, but in conjunction with that, Samantha and Caleb have this expansion in mind. So Steph, if you can turn to the next page, um, or I think two pages. One more, okay. So before I told you to look at that side porch, which was right here, that's gone. I told you to look at the deck, which is gone and replaced with addition. Um, and I told you to look at the garage, which was a little further back before, but has been moved up. So this is the addition that's planned. Um, <coughs> and it includes a single car garage here and that it includes, you know, house expansion here. Um, you can see over here, um, the dotted line starts in the orange part of the house and goes back. That's the left side setback. You can see that there's a little triangle here that doesn't conform. That's the same triangle that you know, the deck was in the same position, but now the addition will be there. So there's a little triangle there, but then the rest of the addition is compliant with the with the left side. On the, on the right side, um, we, have a, we have proposed a slight expansion of the uh, Ginsburg lot and then a slight jog to accommodate this garage addition. Um, the existing garage is a half a foot off the line. The proposed garage will be, um, the, the wall will be two feet off the line. Um, so that's an improvement and then the proposed lot line will continue. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why? Why aren't you giving more land to Caleb and Samantha? Um, and the reason for that is that we're trying to reflect what the historical use, the historical boundary has been between the properties. In other words, for you know all these decades now, um, the the lots have been occupied uh, in roughly the same way we propose. If you look at, and you can look at the exhibit C, which is on page 111 of your packet, <clears throat> the second, or wait, page 112, I suppose, there is a shot from the street. So basically what you'll see from the street is, you know, there's parking here for the Splains, there's parking here for the Ginsburgs, and the Splains have been occupying and tending, you know, this entire area here. So actually, you don't have to flip back, but just so you know, remember that T-shape 
part of their house was actually on that T. So their house and their paved asphalt parking and then their gardens and the fences, all these things have basically been the historical use and the historical division of the property. So when the Ginsburgs realized the issue and went to uh, enlist the Splains and we all sat down and talked about it, the decision was made, well, let's just, this is how we've been using it, let's continue to use it in this fashion. Um, so what does that mean for the addition um, and for the lots in general? The lots are getting more conforming in all respects. Um, lot coverage, and the other thing actually, the other reason why the splains are getting more here in addition to the historical use is one reason why they've historically used more of this land is because they have a duplex and Caleb and Samantha have a single family. Um, so the duplex obviously requires more parking and for density reasons, it, it's helpful if they have the larger lot. So the proposal is to uh, eliminate the T, to set the lot line in, in this fashion, um, which makes, uh, it makes it slightly more conforming for Caleb and Samantha with respect to frontage. It makes it a lot more conforming um, with respect to area because they're getting the whole top of the T over here in the, in the white circle. Um, and I think it brings their lot up to about 66,000 square feet where right now it's 4,906. Um, the Splain lot will become, uh, it currently is a duplex on 4,802 square feet um, and it's gonna be uh, now an 8,640 square foot lot um, and it'll have 57 feet of frontage here instead of 36. In terms of the um, lot coverage, we have the existing and proposed um, building and lot coverage, building coverage and open space here. We are um, increasing the size of the Ginsburg lot. So even though we're putting this addition on it, um, we're still um, decreasing lot coverage compared to existing conditions. We are over what the ordinance requires as proposed. Um, which is why staff requested that we seek relief, but we are under what the existing lot coverage is. Um, right now, lot coverage is, excuse me, building coverage on the Ginsburg lot is 28.5%. Um, and that's comprised of, remember the house, the garage, the deck, some of those things are being taken away and they're being replaced by one addition which serves as the garage, the house, etc. There's no deck anymore, there's a little pervious patio instead. Um, coverage as proposed goes down to 27.2, which is listed over here. Open space also increases from, it looks like 51% to 57%. Um, and then of course it's the same for the Splain lot. Their coverage and their lot space and their lot size, all of that becomes more conforming. Um, the request for relief is basically just to accommodate the, the setback for the garage addition over here um, keeping in mind that it is an improvement compared to existing conditions, but it does still require relief. And then uh, the variance for the slight um, encroachment over here on the left side. I go through the criteria in the ordinance. Um, I don't want to belabor the point. I think the record is clear from what I've submitted, but as you know, we look at um, in terms of public interest and spirit of the ordinance, we're asking whether um, the ordinance, whether the relief conflicts with the ordinance to such a degree that it undermines basic zoning objectives. Uh, we would submit it does not. Um, 
another way to look at it, as the case law says, is will this alter the essential character of the, of the locality or will it threaten the public health, safety, and welfare? Um, for the reasons we've discussed, uh, we don't believe it will. Uh, we believe it meets this criteria because it's improving so many things on the lot. It's improving the, the sort of the property deed nonconformance uh, mess up, and then it's improving uh, coverage and setbacks um, significantly for both um, for both parties. Substantial justice will be done essentially for the same reason. Um, the proposed addition uh, matches the existing conditions on the left, um, and it increases the right side yard setback. Um, it's also agreed to by the splains and indeed all the surrounding abutters. So there's no benefit to the public from denying the variances. Uh, the Ginsburgs, however, will suffer great harm because they'll be unable to construct the addition to make this house uh, accommodate their growing family. Um, granting the variance will not diminish the surrounding property values. Essentially, same reasons. We've got the support of all the abutters. Um, and to look at the proposed addition um, and to look at the properties from the street, um, they're going to look very similar to the way they've always looked in terms of where the boundary line is and how far structures are um, because no one's obviously known that there was this no man's land between the two properties. Um, the setbacks are improved um, and again agreed to by all. Um, so for those reasons, we would say that granting the variance for the addition with an improved right side setback and decreased coverage uh, than existing and increased over, um, open space compared to existing conditions, um, none of that is going to diminish the value of surrounding property values. Uh, special conditions distinguish the property um, from others in the area. This is an interesting area of town because some of the lots are very small and narrow like Caleb's. Some are a little bigger because they may have been double lots or the like. <clears throat> Some of them are shorter and fatter lots, um, but may be roughly around the same size. Um, in this situation, I would submit to you that the, the setback relief that's required is a direct function of the very narrow shape, long and narrow shape of this lot. Um, <coughs> it's only uh, going to be, as proposed, 37 feet wide, um, and you've got a house, you know, roughly uh, more than 20 feet wide, there's really not going to be a way for you to achieve the setbacks. Uh, similarly, with um, the non-conforming lot size, um, that's going to make it different for, difficult for you to achieve the 25 percent coverage, but as I said, we are decreasing coverage compared to what exists there today. Um, for those reasons, in addition to the fact that, you know, you had this bizarre problem with the no man's land between them, this is just a special condition regardless. Uh, no fair and substantial relationship exists. Uh, again, I would say given the purposes of yard setbacks, um, the fact that sort of on the ground there's going to appear to be uh, sort of a similar division line between the properties that exists right now. The um, the garage is going to be accommodated um, and assented to by the splains, who are the most directly affected. Um, and they'll be sort of, because of just where their, their building is, there's still going to be some open space between the two buildings here. I would say there's no fair and substantial relationship. Um, similarly, the proposed use is reasonable. Um, it's a residential use in a residential zone. It is making a larger home. Um, but the request is reasonable in light of the size and width of the property. Um, I'm just going to ask if Alex has anything to add. He's here if you have any questions. Um, Charlie answered some specific questions about, um, you know, Charlie, why is the garage the size it is? Um, and he would tell you if he speaks on Zoom and certainly his email describes uh, the size of the garage. Um, he's essentially making it as small as he can. It's a little, um, it will accommodate one car and a little bit of, there's no shed or anything, so it'll 
accommodate one car and then a little bit of space for bikes and lawnmowers and the like. Um, he can answer more specific detailed questions about that, but I'll stop there. Are there questions? Mr. Rossi. The uh, right-hand side of the new structure, that, that edge, that foundation, let's say, uh, right where you're pointing now, is that the same distance from the Splains structure as the current garage is? You know what I'm saying? Is it is it moving over to the right, or is it in line with where the current garage is? That's I couldn't quite tell from looking at the. Well, I think it's moving a little bit because the lot line has moved a little bit, and so the proposed garage has sort of filled in that space. Oh yes, thank you. If you Staff, if you want to go back, you need to take the microphone with you. Staff, if you want to switch back to the existing conditions plan, so that's back to, oh no. Yeah, so you can see that it slid forward. There was a little jog, a little bit in the lot line before, but we, we, we moved this a little bit this way, and then we have a little bit of a jog here. So the garage is sliding up, but you know, I agree, the proposed garage is a little bit bigger than the garage that we have now. So it does sort of take some of that space that we've created by adjusting the lot line. But it still is an improvement over how close it is here. It's interesting because uh, I'm sure this was the result of a lot of in negotiation, but the, uh, you know, the new lot line which is not our our jurisdiction really to approve or not approve, but it's at some point, you know, many decades from now when these structures no longer exist, somebody's going to look at that lot line and say, boy, that's really weird that it's got that little zigzag in it. But it's, and the, it's, it's really a case where the lot line is changing to bring the building into conformance rather than, or closer to conformance than rather than the building changing to become more conformant. I can see why you say that, and we've gone back and forth over a couple different, I mean, ultimately the planning board will evaluate that lot line and they may say, you know, we don't like that jog. We had explored, you know, a couple of different ways to do it, like maybe, you know, maybe a little bit more, you know, like mm -hmm. not, not like a square, you know, in the middle, um, but ultimately, you know, the parties felt very comfortable with doing it this way. Um, well, as you say, that'll be the business of the zoning board. Uh, yeah, the planning, <laughs> the planning. And I would say, I guess, regardless, I, this may be for staff to interpret, but I think if you were to propose, if you were to approve a variance for, you know, the garage in, you know, X distance from the lot line, um, you know, if there was I don't know if we, I guess I don't know, Steph, if we would have to come back if the planning board, you know, wanted something different. I don't know if we would have to come back as long as we build a garage, you know, at that we... setback. Sorry, okay. You can go back to the proposed Do you conditions. Have questions, Mr. Rossi? Nope. Does anybody else have, yes, Ms. Margeson. I just have a quick question. So the left yard setback, the left yard, yep. um, it's seven feet. Uh, the entire way, but in the beginning, it's not. I'm just wondering how it's always how it that seven feet is at the right at the front of Bartlett Street. And this is I'm just curious. So please. Well, it's actually it's three feet here. Um, you know, the house is sort of on an angle compared to the lot line, um, but the setback to the house is three point six feet here. And it's seven feet at this corner. Um, and then it's 9.3 feet at that deck. Um, the reason why we asked for the seven was because in the proposed condition page, if you go forward to, go, th go one more to the, yeah, so in the proposed, we asked for the seven <coughs> because that's sort of where we're filling in and we're attaching to the existing house. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see where I'm pointing. Yeah, I, I can. It's just that the existing condition says that it's seven feet and it's, it's, uh, it seems it's like not. it's three. So. Uh, where are you? 
just in the staff report. No, I'm sorry. It's a. Uh, it says seven. Existing is seven. There's and nothing that mentions the three point. Yeah. Yeah, that's because we're not expanding in that area. The it's three foot at this corner. Okay. It's seven feet at this corner, and that's where we're putting an addition on. Yeah. So. Okay. That's why we've said it's seven feet here now, and it's going to continue to be seven feet but it's only going to be non-conforming for a little sliver because if you look, I don't know if you can zoom in stuff, but if you look, you'll see the building envelope is this dotted line that's right there. So you can see the dotted line go through the building, through the orange building, and then into the purple building before it, it meets up with the edge of the purple right here. Do you understand? Yeah, oh, I totally understand. I was just so it's just that triangle there. Yeah. And then by the time you get to the back, it conforms at, mm -hmm. I believe, ten. Ten feet. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Please. So, if, are you referring to the staff memo? Yes. And why that table doesn't reflect? That's because that's because it's what I said in my memo. I you can explain. Yeah. So, the 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 reason is that the front portion of that house isn't changing. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think it was relevant to say it's existing at 3.6 and it proposed at seven. That portion is directly related to where that change starts. Um, it, if you would like it interpreted differently in the future, mm -hmm. I'm okay with. No, it was just a question. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes the question is seriously. just a question. <laughs> Um, and it might help to just illustrate that to look at the architectural plans, which yeah, start no, I got it. Five. It's fine. It's fine. Mr. Rossi, do you have a question? No. I'm sorry. We still. Uh, you were pointing to. <laughs> One of you, please speak. Okay. Yes, I was just okay. going to ask a question. Uh, if you looked into trying to, I'm not sure that you could actually do it, but if you looked into trying to have it where you could turn into the garage so that you had a bigger setback, um, so that you. If the, so that the garage was more behind the house rather than okay. uh, so close to the oh, That's an interesting idea. I think part of that has to do with, that might have to do with the turning radius of trying to come in and, and sort of make that turn. And I expect part of it has to do with, you know, how the, how the rooms proposed, like how it was going to all fit together. In, in terms of you know it would be a it would be a different situation on the inside if you were trying to accommodate you know two extra bedrooms in you know a, a narrow skinny thing so but I don't know Alex can speak to if, if you think I, I haven't got I, I was just wondering if the turning radius would be too tight uh, that's correct the, the turning radius would be too tight and and we're kind of limited here in that Alex, can you just speak into the mic, please? Sure. Sorry. Um, so what I was saying is it's correct. We wouldn't have enough width there for a turning radius. Um, Monica kind of went over a lot of items, but what we're trying to do with that driveway is um, split it right down the middle because that's the way it's being <laughs> used. So when, when that line is set and then as we go back, um, we're, we just don't have enough width. Okay. I'm sorry, could you please tell us your name and address? Uh, Alex that? Ross with Ross Engineering. Thank you. Mr. Rayum. You all set? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, I do just one quick comment is, is I know you, we keep, you keep talking about this as a garage addition. It's quite a bit more than that. It's really a house addition with a small garage tucked in underneath it. Um, in fact, the size of the addition really is almost about the size of the uh, original house. Not that the original house was very big, um, so I'll, I'll grant you that. But I guess what my question is, uh, going back to uh, page 104 of our packet, the site plan that you have up now, um, it would seem like you could have avoided um, coming to this uh, board altogether if the lot line was drawn closer to the um, 295-299 Bartlett Street house and you uh, processed an easement 
for um, driving and parking on that uh, on that property. And it looks like you could get the 10 foot setback and you, you would then be more within, you know, well within the coverage requirement. Why did you not choose that approach? I think I need you to say some of that again. The, if we had, I can understand, you know, yep. build a smaller addition, but the stuff about the easement and the driving, I didn't quite catch. Sure. So you, your, your argument for the selection of where you put the property line between the two properties is, hey, this is how it's traditionally been used. Okay, I, I get that that part. But your your um, your client is also proposing this, you know, pretty good size addition to uh, their existing home. If, if you could draw the, the line, um, why was the line not drawn closer to the neighboring property of 295 slash 299 Bartlett Street, put it closer along the, the line of that house, and then simply create a, an easement uh, within the forward part of the property um, that would say that the, the neighboring home has the ability to use this as a parking area and maybe also like a, a maintenance easement as well which would say that they can park there and they can use it as a as a maintenance easement and then you would have your required setback um, at least on this side of the house i guess the opposite side of the house you would still probably need to come before us but then also your coverage would be more than covered so i'm just curious what if there was any thought given to that alternative well again this is a dicey situation um, because you have a scenario where people have been occupying a lot in a certain way that uh, essentially the splains um, could could lay claim to you know most of that T right because the way they were using the property was to they had this 22 foot area here that's all part of the T right and they've just been using it part of their houses on it and they've been using it and maintaining it the whole time so it's a tough sell to um, to get them to give that up and I and I'm not I'm not suggesting in any way that they be unreasonable but I'm just saying like as a legal proposition that's a tough because they've had the the occupancy and the exclusive possession um, so they would have had a claim against the uh, original heirs you know to say hey we've been occupying this um, you know to the exclusion of somebody else for you know a while so we have you know fee you know we we hold title and fee as a result mm -hmm. um, so I think that's part of the reason the other reason is that um, well, I don't know is there another reason uh, I, I guess I don't know if if, if that line I'm sorry, shifts, you need to speak into the mic. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I guess if that line shifted to the east, wouldn't a variance be required for the Splains house? Yes. Yeah, well, we don't, we don't seem to care about that because um, we're, I, I don't know, I would ask the staff going that. to recommend that we go ahead with this petition as it's presented yeah. to us. If they sure. wanted to do it differently, we would be looking at something different tonight. Okay. So If the planning board doesn't approve it, that's a whole other story. But tonight, this is what we have. Sure. Um, that's fine. I'm trying to understand their reasoning, uh, Madam Chair. So that was my reasoning okay. for, the, for the question and trying to explain to them. Um, what the possibility was. Uh, my other question for you then, and again, this is a pretty substantial, uh, almost two-story structure. Um, have you included a maintenance easement on the new addition on the Splain side of the property so that there is a legal basis for your client to be able to do maintenance on their property that is only going to be two feet back from the property line? We have discussed that. and. All parties are willing to do that. If you want to make that as a condition of approval, we'd be happy to draft it up. I haven't drafted the document, but it is something that we discussed. We knew it was something you'd be interested in. Um, and I will say in terms of the lot line, we were just trying to finagle a situation where both lots got more conforming rather than less. And I do think we would have been required to get a variance if we were placing the property line uh, too close to the Splain house. Okay. But, you know, we can not talk about hypotheticals okay. there, if that would. Any... And one, one additional question. I do I have another okay. answer, too, but go ahead. No, uh, and then the rear property line uh, behind the 
behind the new addition. It looks like there's some planter boxes and things there. Is that the basis for choosing the property line to go in that area is these historic planter boxes? Is that what I'm trying to understand? Yes, there's a, as I recall, there's a fence already there. Okay. Am I right about that? Yes. Yeah, so again, it was all about trying to preserve what's, what's on the ground now. In terms of, in response to your other question, Member, member Rayum, um, I'm usually the member of the team that asks, why is, it, why is it so big? Why can't you do this side of the other thing? Um, I found it interesting as I was preparing today to review on the site plan, page 104. Um, I don't know if you can zoom in here, but if you look at the existing and the proposed coverage, um, you can see that we're taking away uh, a rather large deck where, you know, it looks, if you just look at the proposed and say, oh my God, there's an addition of a thousand square feet, um, it looks a little jarring. But when you go up to the existing and you look and you compare like porch deck 434, well, that's going down to 134. And then you go up and see, well, the garage is going away entirely. It's going to be incorporated into this 124 or 1,024. Um, that also makes a difference. Um, so I think it's about, I was trying to do the math as I was sitting here. I, would, I want to say it's maybe a net increase of, you know, under 500 square feet. Mm -hmm. So that, that frames it differently for me. I don't know if it does for you, but... We, if you go back to that first existing conditions page and look at that deck and look at that existing garage and realize that we're just trying to pull the garage forward and fill it in um, while accommodating, you know, certain requirements in terms of the width of the garage, the width of the door, um, and then some of the upstairs items, um, which are addressed by um, member, uh, Charlie Hoyt which I think I handed all my copies in, and now yeah. I don't have one to read to you, but um, you can look at that as it describes his thinking in terms of the design um, and his answer to the question of, you know, why. Are there any other questions? Okay. Then the public hearing is closed. Yeah, we have to... I'm sorry, what? Butters? <laughs> uh, I'm comment. sorry, public comment. <laughs> it's time for the public, sorry. So are you rescinding that closing of the public hearing? Yes. Hmm? Yes. So you're not closing the public I'm not, hearing? I'm sorry, I'm rescinding the closing. I just am opening it to comment, comments. Is there anyone to speak in favor of this petition? Anyone to speak in favor? Anyone to speak in opposition? Anyone to speak to, for, or against? Now yeah, the public hearing is closed. Thank you. Okay, and it is back to us. I have a question for staff, if Please I may. Go. Yes. Um, so your staff recommendation um, regarding including a stipulation about subdivision review, what is the basis for putting that recommendation in? Um. To be honest, that was pulled over from the last one, which was written by Jillian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean. I mean, to me, it's kind of obvious, but I'm just curious if there was any I, particular concern. I agree. I didn't want to remove that okay. on her. Um, it, okay. does, it doesn't add anything and doesn't take anything away in my mind. All right. But also to make it overly obvious that this is not a final subdivision yet and that that line is not. Mm -hmm set in stone until it is approved by the planning board. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Mr. Rayum. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd be prepared to make a motion if, if you're willing to accept it. Yes, that would be welcome. I, I would move that we um, approve the um, request as uh, presented and advertised with the stipulation that a um, suitable maintenance uh, easement be provided on the uh, lot, um, the new lot that's being created. 162-14 increase in size so okay all second please okay there's a second but I, the, we need the yes, there is sample, also yeah. the suggest the lot line adjustment. lot line is, should be in the motion uh, I, I mean I it didn't sound like staff was that 
concerned the, about it. I, I the second in our staff recommendation, it does suggest that. But I, I guess my opinion was it was all. It's, it's obvious. I don't see any added value, but if, if the seconder of the motion is adamant about it, we can add it in. I, I think just for good measure, because they do have to do a lot line adjustment mm -hmm. by the planning board. Sure, and I will also add a second stipulation as recommended by the um, by someone in the planning uh, department about a subdivision review and approval by the planning board as required for the proposed lot line adjustment. Belt and suspenders. We'll do it. Better that way. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, so. Uh, you know, two foot setback. Um, you know, creating new new property lines and including a two foot um, setback on a um, you know proposed addition that um, you know it doesn't exist yet. It, it, when I first looked at it, it gave me some heartburn. Um, you know, why didn't we go and, and try and do something more to uh, avoid that situation? So that's why I really wanted to make sure that the applicant you know had at least thought about it. Um, I do think it. It is an important data point for us to say that we can live with that, and I, I think I can, so long as there is some provision put into the um, the new you know agreement between the two new properties that uh, recognizes that there's a pretty substantial size structure that's going to be very close to the property line that will need uh, maintenance, and there there is an ability for the uh, for the owner of the 303 Bartlett Street side uh, to uh, to properly maintain that. That uh, substantial addition. So, with that, granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest, and in granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. Um, again, throughout this neighborhood, you do have some fairly tight lines. Um, you know, there, there seem it might have seemed like there was an opportunity to create something somewhat more, slightly more conforming here, but there is historic use of these um, two properties, even if it was um, de facto rather than de jure. I do think that the uh, the applicant is trying to uh, you know recognize that de facto use of each of them and it's sort of driving what's what's being looked at here. The applicant really sort of had a uh, a plan to create this addition before all of this was known in detail. Um, I'm I'm certain it was probably a shock to the applicant when you discover that your property is not what you think your property is, uh, but it does sound like um, the two neighbors have been able to amicably work out. Um, uh, this end result, and I, you know, they understand the impacts. Each each understands the impacts very well to uh, what they're agreeing upon here, and therefore, I, I think that that sort of also reduces some of the concerns that um, that you would, you know, be upsetting one one or the other by this this very tight um, setback uh, being in there. So, um, you know, the spirit of the ordinance it is very tight uh, relative to what uh, we would normally require. Less so on the on the side um, facing away from the applicant. They're really just sort of extending an existing line. So the seven feet that eventually increases to the full um, requirement of ten feet um, is is a bit more palatable there. The actual amount of um, injury to the, um, the ordinance requirement is is less. Um, and then the the property line. There is certainly enough open space. It's it's. Almost equivalent to kind of the sort of the open space that was already existing, a bit higher in in elevation than what was there before. But I think with the maintenance easement and with the understanding of both parties as they create this line, it, it uh, there's nothing in the public interest that would outweigh the um, the applicants and the applicants neighbors um, you know decision here to, to run the property line where they did. Uh, Granting the variance would do substantial justice. Again, there's really no public. Uh, concern here. It's really the concern between these two neighboring properties. Uh, they're both well aware of what they're agreeing to, um, and that's satisfactory. Granting the variance would not diminish the values of surrounding properties. Um, again, this is sort of a situation that's been in place for a long time. It had an undefined property line. This is simply sort of defining something that was already in existence. Um, and then the proposed addition is certainly, uh, you know, overall tasteful. It's it is adding significantly to the size of the existing home and should increase its value and therefore the value of surrounding properties. And then little enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. Um, so I do think there is a hardship here in the sense that you have this um, sort of odd situation where you had an uh, undefined property line, uh, an actual piece of property that was owned by somebody else without really fully realizing it, uh, historical usage. Um, so this is really two um, property owners coming together to come up with an adequate solution that meets meets everybody's needs. The addition is uh, a a reasonable one considering the very small size of the existing house. 
Um, they're adding on to it in a way that is, you know, no taller than what the existing house is. Um, they already have a garage. They are moving it to be under uh, this addition. Um, so in, in general, there's really nothing that here that is um, uh, unreasonable in what's being asked for. So uh, with that, I recommend approval. Does the second have anything to add, Ms. Morgerson? And no, I don't think as to the approval. I just do want to commend the applicants for a, a really thorough um, application. Uh, a lot of hard work is represented in this application. Um, and um, it's a very unique application given the T structure in the middle. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it was a very good example of being able to work out and negotiate your differences. and and come to an agreement and um, you know I commend you for that uh, yeah I just wanted to point out something that uh, I, that uh, convinced me to uh, move in favor of this um, is uh, this is a, a, a 37 to 42 foot wide lot which is extremely narrow and driving a lot of this issue where 100 feet is required um, and even with the uh, increased um, land that would result from the proposed uh, lot line revisions, it's still smaller than what's allowed. So um, normally I would be quite hesitant to, for something so close to the side yard setback, but uh, given the nature of that and um, the agreement reached between the neighbors uh, with, on that lot line, um, I found it quite compelling. I'm sorry, Mr. I did forget one thing in my motion. Uh, you know, to the lot, the lot coverage. I mean, it's just two and a half percent over. Um, you know, and it's it is less than what is existing in terms of all the other structures uh, combined that were there that are being removed to allow this addition to be put on. So, with with that, uh, I don't think that's egregious either. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Then a yes vote is allows the project to go through. Ms. Record. Yes. Mr. Mantle. Yes. Ms. Margeson. Yes. Mr. Rayum. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair votes yes. You are all set. Well, with us. A lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this next um, item, yeah. um, Mr. Rayum is recusing himself. No. No, no, I'm sorry. I skipped a line. Sorry. <laughs> Our next item is the request of J and J's Drop and Drive, LLC, for a property located at 459 Islington Street. Okay. Whereas relief is needed to install a 54-square-foot mural, which requires the following. One, variance from Section 10.1251.1251 to allow 50 square, 54 square feet of aggregate sign area where 48.5 is allowed. And two, variance from Section 10.1251.2 to allow 54 square feet of individual sign area where 16 feet is allowed. Said property is located on Assessor Map 157, Lot 7, and lies within the Character District 4 and 4 L2 and Historic District. Go ahead, please. Hi there. <laughs> um, my name is Terrence Parker. I'm a uh, Terra Firma Landscape Architecture landscape architect and site artist. I'm representing the owners of uh, Liars Bench Brewery and the J&J &J, um, Drop and Drive, which is the landlord of the brewery. So as you know, the city of Portsmouth does not have a mural ordinance, so the murals have to fall under you know, the sign guidelines. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you recall, some of you were on the board several years ago when I presented the Ruth Blay mural that's on Court Street. This is in the similar vein of that mural in that it's part of the History Through Art project um, where there's, you know, 18, 17 or 18 women that we're trying to get murals of that have uh, important history in the Seacoast area, including um, Sarah Orne Jewett. Uh, she was an author from the 19th century and a contemporary of um, Celia Thaxter. So um, I could talk about the mural. I could talk about how it uh, we need the we we need the variances uh, from the sign ordinance, even though murals aren't signs, because of the special exceptions 
of this particular brewery. Um, it, there's some dimensional requirements that we exceed, which you've cited the ordinances um, earlier. And there's the fact that the, the west side of the building, uh, the, the Liars Bench Brewery has no street frontage, so the mural has to be on the west side of the building, which faces the parking lot and then the, uh, uh, the drive-through area of the abutting bank. Um, so um, in our opinion, um, the mural is not contrary to uh, public interest. It uh, observes the spirit of the ordinance in that it enhances the character of the region by promoting its rich history. Uh, it's, it's location, we don't have street frontage, as I said, so it doesn't create a, a site hazard. Um, the size of the mural does not create a hazard or distraction as the design is subdued in its color scheme and content. Substantial justice would be done because there is no obvious harm to the public by having a mural, which is more like a painting hanging on a wall. Um, and it would benefit the public due to the ed educational components um, because the mural is very tastefully designed. Um, the values of the surrounding properties are not diminished at all because there are there's Dunkin' Donuts, the bank, there's abundant, uh, an abundance of you know, commercial graphics nearby, and this is not a commercial graphic, and it in no way represents any, any of the products that the brewery dispenses. So it's a complete art project, so it's not a sign at all. And the literal, literal enforcement of the ordinance would result in an un unnecessary hardship because the, you know, the building, as I said, has no frontage. It has to be on the parking lot side facing the bank. So uh, not to do that, not to allow a, a mural there would create a hardship uh, for the owners. Um, so I, I don't have much more to say unless you have questions about the, the mural and the design and what our intents going forward are. <coughs> You will see another mural in the history of our theme, probably next at your next meeting, um, that has to do with the history of the, you know, the North End, um, in the the Italian district, and the, the. Anyway, I won't get into that one. But. Okay. So if you, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Mr. Rossi. I do have two questions for you. Uh, one is with regard to the size of the mural. You're requesting two variances. Uh, the first of which is. The aggregate sign area, uh, what is actually allowed is 48.5 square feet as opposed to the 54 square feet. Why, why 54 and not 48? Why, why didn't you just Because we were it? designing it to meet the open space of that particular portion between the, 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 the side entrance door and one of the garage doors. Um, so it was really an, an aesthetic decision based on the space and trying to create a you know, certain breadth of, you know, it's blue vinyl right there. So we're trying to create a certain boundary of blue around the, the mural. And because it's a mural, it has to be large enough to be read because there are historic graphics. There's, there's text um, on the mural that describes the, you know, the life history of the author. So it has to be large enough to be read. Second question I have for you is with regard to the durability of the material that's being used. Uh, it's a uh, basically a vinyl print that's affixed to an aluminum sheet. Is that correct? Like Alumicore or something like that? Yeah, and that will be that will be uh, I forgot the process, but solar sealed onto that uh, metal uh, uh, back backing. It's a aluminum backing. And I understand it'll have a, about a 12-year, as, as opposed to the roof blade, which is on a concrete block, this is on a, adhered to a, a, a metal panel. So it'll probably have a longer 12-year lifespan. The roof blade is not, not a vinyl print, though, is it? That's, no, that's a vinyl. That's awful. Oh, it is? Also oh, I didn't know that. Huh. Polyvinyl graphic. Okay, interesting. And that's glued like wallpaper onto yeah. the um, concrete block. Okay, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Are there other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone to speak in favor of this petition? I think I'm going to have to. Is anyone to speak in opposition to this petition? Anyone to speak to, for, or against this petition? Okay. Then the public hearing is closed. And I just want to say again that. MLU are the uh, alternate on this one. 
Thank you. You are the voter on this one. Well, I, I guess I'll speak. Um, so this this application brings us into the same conundrum that this board faced back uh, with the roof play um, case on 165 Court Street. Um, unfortunately, our ordinance doesn't really reflect um, the idea of uh, public art of that large a magnitude being displayed. Um, so we sort of send it into the sign ordinance, um, even though it's um, you know not really a sign in the sense that it's really not doing anything to advertise. Um, what anything that's taking place in any of the the businesses in that area um, it's intended to be a, a, a source of art and inspiration for the surrounding public um, you know and, and how we ever got away with the well the Wyland uh, Wailing Wall on the old Cabot House building I'm, I'm not entirely sure but but they got away with that uh, before all for all this came down I guess somehow uh, from the worth lot not that the, all that didn't fall apart because it wasn't polyvinyl it was paint and it and it all kind of fall apart on the, on the brick but that's all another story so um, I mean I I, I I wish our ordinance could somehow re better reflect this um, you know it is tricky we've run into similar issues where okay is um, you know somebody painting their building in their logo colors um, is that now a sign because it's represented with their logo you know signage is is kind of a, a, of a funky thing but I do think that uh, in this particular case is really this is completely divorced from from anything that's taking place inside the business, I, I do think it, as a result, because our ordinance really doesn't have a provision for public art of this size, scope, and nature, that um, that you know, if we have to apply the sign ordinance to it, I do think that gives it certainly the hardship necessary to be able to say that it it shouldn't comply. Uh, and I would say overall, this is you know a reasonably sized um, piece of artwork. It's not overly ostentatious. It's not going to. It's pretty far down into a parking lot. It's not going to unnecessarily distract drivers who are going by um, those kinds of concerns you might have with uh, with you know normally a large signage thank you Ms. Morrison. so I, I'm sorry to say I won't support this um, not because I'm against the concept I think it's it's great I wish the the city did have a a mural um, or a public art um, was that was folded into our ordinance I think um, or included in our ordinance I think putting this within the sign ordinance is tricky um, I realize that this is not selling a business but then what happens if we get a variance request for a business that wants to go larger and you know we're applying one standard for public art murals and then another for for businesses I I, I would I, I will not be supporting it I don't know what the feelings on the board are but I would hope that the City Council would consider um, passing a public art mural ordinance to allow these things especially since apparently it's a city initiative um, I think that is really important and really valuable but I I don't feel like this really adequately fits into the sign ordinance so I will not be supporting it Mr. Um. Rossi. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think for similar reasons, I actually would support it because the um, the hardship is that it's uh, there's no fair and substantial relationship between the purpose of the sign ordinance and this mural. So, I, and that's and that would protect from uh, the the situation where an actual sign uh, advertising something for the business or whatever. Uh, there, so there's a distinction to be drawn. Um, and uh, unique uh, uh, differences between the, the applications so it doesn't necessarily set us up even though I totally agree I would I prefer this to be dealt with uh, through the, the, city, council, the city council and, and the ordinance itself but mm -hmm. um, I just do see that as a, a way to address both the hardship and um, not setting ourselves up for a precedent uh, it could be met in that manner with regard to precedent, uh, the last time we approved a mural, which was just a few months, sorry, am I, am I mumbling again? Well, I, well that, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't what I was looking at you for. I was remembering the last time uh, we had to do we, um, you know, we, we were also thinking about it as possibly these public murals 
uh, fitting into the definition of a museum, which is a permitted use in the CD4L2 district wherein this lies. Uh, because it is art, it is for public access, uh, just because nobody is charging for it and you don't have to walk inside a building, it's kind of a hybrid use, which a commercial uh, signage would not uh, benefit from. Thank you. Mr. Ram. Yeah, just to add, I, I mean, I do think actually Ms. Marchand does have a good fundamental point. I mean, we are granting a variance for a sign. Um, I would hope that in the future that we could confine if somebody else wanted to try and take advantage of that. Um, in a different way that it could be um, tied back to, well, no, this was granted for a piece of artwork. But there is risk. Um, I, I, I see where Ms. Marchison is coming from on that. And, I, and So I, I know that we can sometimes make legislative suggestions mm -hmm. to the city council, and this might be, I mean, I don't know. I, it, it seems like people will approve this, but I think that this might be um, a legislative suggestion to the city council to be considered a future board because I do think that these are wonderful, mm -hmm. and you know, and but, more of them will be coming. Yes, and more of them will be coming. So, yeah. but I mean, it's great to know that people going into Liars Brewery would be reading about Sarah Warren Jewett, you know. But I, 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 I just can't support it. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I don't recommend holding our breath because I've been waiting for eight years now for our chickens. <laughs> so, would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. I move that we grant a variance to, I don't recall the name of the applicant, although Terrence, um, uh, to permit the, bear with me, what it's called, the mural, the Sarah, the Sarah Orange Jew, Jewett mural, mm -hmm. the request of JJ's Drop and Drive LLC owner for property located at 459 Islington Street to grant a variance from section 10.1251. Point one zero to allow a 54 square foot of aggregate sign where only 48.5 is allowed and two to grant a variance from section 10.1251.20 to allow 54 square feet of individual sign area where 16 square feet is allowed. Um, and the basis for uh, recommending that we grant the variance is that. Sec hold on a second. Oh. Is there a second to this? I'll second. Oh, then I go. Okay. Now you may go ahead. Thank you so much. Granting us. the variance would not be contrary to the public interest. The variance requested here, though it is an expansion of foot, is for a particular um, expansion, a mural as part of the um, something or other history project. And <laughs> and, and looking at it, it is, um, I, I mean, you know, we're looking at something. It is not backlit. It is not frontlit. It is tasteful and therefore it would not be contrary to the public interest. Granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. Actually, I, I'm going to say this. Uh, the ordinance does not want obnoxious signs. This is not an obnoxious sign, and I think it doesn't do a disservice to the area. If it was advertising Liar's Bench, I'm not sure that it would be any worse. I like this better. The applicant has made a good case for why a larger sign for this particular presentation is required. That is so it can be read, and I, I follow that. Granting the variance would do substantial justice. I would say on this one, it, given the location and the abutting uses and the absence of anybody protesting, I would say that it does justice. It advances uh, an important thing, which is the information presented on the sign. Granting the variance would not diminish the values of surrounding properties. There's no evidence of that, and therefore I would offer that from a personal standpoint, it probably would enhance the value of surrounding properties. And literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would not result in an unnecessary hardship the property has special conditions because it is not fronting on Islington Street that distinguish it from other properties. And so owing to these special conditions, a uh, fair and substantial relationship doesn't exist between the pr public purposes of the sign ordinance and the application of that provision here where the sign is on the side of the building and is not creating any traffic hazard um, visual problem for anybody coming by. It's actually facing a bank um, not even the Dunkin' Donuts, just a bank, and, 
and a drive through at that. So I, I think all of those criteria are satisfied. Mr. Rossi, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I would just add that. <laughs> Uh, I would just add that the proposed use is a, a reasonable one and um, it doesn't uh, threaten public health, safety, or welfare. So I'm in support of it. Okay. Good discussion on the motion? If not, a yes vote allows the mural. Ms. Geffert? Yes. Mr. Mantle? Yes. Ms. Margerson? No. Mr. Bayum? Yes. Mr. Rossi? Yes. Mr. Matson? Yes. And the chair votes yes. So this is approved. You are approved. Okay, now Mr. Bam will be recused for this item and Ms. Gefford and Ms. Record will be Ooh, super voting. So this is item B, the request of Wayne G. Clough, owner and, so, and Sofari Star, and forgive my pronunciation, for property located at 100 Islington Street, Unit 6, whereas relief is needed to allow an esthetician business, which requires a special exception from section 10.440, use number 7.20, where it is permitted by special exception. Said property is located on assessor map 137, lot 25-6, and lies with the cat within the character district and historic district. Is there anyone to speak to this petition? Thank you. Um, good evening, board members. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I'm a licensed esthetician and a new business owner. My business is called Skin by Safari, LLC. For those of you who are not familiar with aesthetics, I specialize in custom skincare treatments, brow services, lash services, and facial and body waxing. Um, I found the perfect location to start my business. It is at 100 Islington Street, unit number, unit number six. I will be renting this space from my longtime past employer of 10 years, Dr. Wayne Clough. The property is ready to go and there is no construction to construction to be done at this location. There will be two dedicated parking spaces for me and my client. I will structure my appointments for there to be no overlap between clients. This means there will never be parking issues or heavy traffic related to my business. My hours of operation will be Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, what I'll be practicing as a licensed esthetician will cause no disturbances or hazards to the surrounding area. I'm confident that the property I have chosen fully complies with the special exception standards and city ordinances. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Ms. Murchison. Could you just regress, uh, regress, sorry. Um, I'm regressing. Um, could you please just address the criteria for special exception? Um, um, they're on page 16. Oh, well, it, do you have those? Is it? It's the criteria that you addressed in your letter. I have it up on the um, screen if you wanted to reference well, we it. We will give you one. If oh, you yeah. Page. Yeah. Okay. So. so so I just go through each each one? Please. Just briefly. Okay. I can read your letter. Sure. Um, so standards 10.232.21, the property aligns perfectly with the standards specified in the ordinance for the particular use permitted by a special exception. The space is zoned for commercial use, making it an ideal location for my esthetic, esthetician business. It is in full compliance with the zoning regulations, and I'm committed to adhering to all and the, to all the applicable rules and guidelines set forth by the city. 10.232.22, public safety, the safety of the public and adjacent properties is of utmost importance to me. The property and the services I will be providing have no potential fire hazard, explosion risk, or release of toxic materials. 10.232.23, impact on surrounding area. Um, I'm conscious of the impact my business can have on the surrounding area and the community. The property's location and my business will have no detriment to property values in the vicinity. 
Additionally, my esthetician services will not cause any significant disturbances such as odor, smoke, gas, dust, noise, glare, heat, vibration, or unsightly outdoor storage of equipment, vehicles, or materials. 10.232.24, traffic safety and congestion. My, bus my business will not create any traffic safety hazard or substantially increase traffic congestion. My clients will have ample Parking options, and I'll encourage, I, and I will encourage appointment-based scheduling to manage the flow of visitors efficiently. Ten point two three two point two five municipal services. I'm aware of the importance of not placing excessive demands on municipal services. I ensure that there will be no strain on water, sewer, waste disposable, waste disposal, police, fire protection, or schools. I'm committed to minimizing the impact on these essential services. 10.232.26, stormwater management. My, for, my services will not create, create a significant increase in stormwater runoff onto adjacent property or streets. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Is there anything else you want to say to us? Um, no. Okay. Thank you for your time. Okay, Besides thank you. what took so long. <laughs> yes. Is there um, anyone in the public who would like to speak in favor of this petition? Oh. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam Chairperson and members of the board. Dickie Gamester, 176 Dexter Road, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I am here to support uh, this young lady's application. Um, she has just read to you every item that you worry about, it will not, her application will not impinge upon one of these items and or any property value within 5,000 feet of the particular property. It's probably the least intensive use that could be done in this property. I'm speaking for it and hopefully you'll grant it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in favor? Is there anyone to speak in opposition to the petition? Two for or against? Okay. Then the public hearing is closed. I'd like to is make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so for the special exception criteria 10.232.21, the standards as provided by this ordinance uh, for the particular use are permitted by a special exception. In this case, that is true. 10.232.22, uh, no hazard to the public or adjacent property on account of potential fire, explosion, or release of toxic chemicals. Uh, that is not an issue in this uh, case for the esthetician's uh, services. 10.233.23, um, no detriment to property values in the vicinity or change in the essential characteristics of any area, including residential neighborhoods or business and industrial districts on account of the location or scale of buildings and other structures, parking areas, access ways, odor, smoke, gas, dust, or other pollutant, noise, glare, heat, vibration, or unsightly outdoor storage of equipment, vehicles, or other materials. Uh, this is a very minimally impactful use with no exterior changes to the building. And so that will not be an issue. 10.233.24, no creation of a traffic safety hazard or a substantial increase in the level of traffic congestion in the vicinity. Uh, there's adequate parking and reasonable hours and uh, the appointment-based scheduling will handle the flow of visitors efficiently. 10.233.25, no excessive demand on municipal services, including but not limited to water, sewer, waste, disposal, police, and fire protection, and schools. And in this situation, uh, there will uh, not be an increased or excessive uh, demand uh, given the, the nature of the business. 10.232.26, uh, no significant increase of stormwater runoff onto adjacent property or streets. In this situation, there'll be no exterior changes, so that won't be an issue. Okay. Does the second have anything to I add? I agree. Okay, good. 
right, is there a discussion? If not, we are ready to vote. A yes vote allows this project to go on. Ms. Record. Yes. Ms. Gefford. Yes. Mr. Mannell. Yes. Ms. Margerson. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Rossi. Yes. Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair votes yes. You are in business. There you go. <laughs> Good luck. And last. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Um, item C, the request of Davenport Inn LLC owner for property located at 70 Court Street, whereas relief is needed for the following. One, an after-the-fact variance from section 10.515.14 for six existing permitted mechanical units with a setback of 0.5 feet from unit from the property line. Two, variance from section 10.515.14 to install a seventh mechanical unit with a setback of 0 0.5 feet from the property line, whereas 10 feet is required. And in the alternative, three, equitable waiver from section 10.515.14 for the installation of six, yeah, it's cut off. Oh, no. Sorry, six mechanical units with 0.5 side and yard setbacks. Said property is located on assessor map 116, lot 49, and lies within the character district 4-L1 and historic district. Welcome. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Chris Mulligan from Bozen and Associates here in Portsmouth on behalf of the applicant. Davenport Inn LLC with me is Andrew Simonis, one of the principals of the LLC. Um, before I get started, uh, Andrew uh, was adamant that I thank Ms. Casella and members of the staff who've worked very um, hard uh, with the applicant um, and assisting this project. This has taken a lot of uh, manpower upstairs because of the nature of the project and the number of approvals that uh, it's had to go through. This is a project that some of you will remember was before this board last year for uh, variances um, to allow the use as an inn and also uh, some uh, minor um, dimensional variances. Um, but it also required a conditional use permit from the planning board and a couple of rounds of meetings with the historic district commission um, for uh, exterior improvements on the property. Um, I hope you all had an opportunity to read the online edition of the newspaper today. There was a great article with uh, dozens of photographs of the interior. Um, and this has really been a project that um, my client has uh, really thrown itself into um, and lovingly restored this very important historic property. Um, several hundreds of thousands of dollars have been expended in the renovation and rehabilitation of the project uh, of the property um, the project uh, s thus far is a stunning success um, uh, occupancies are high um, and everything is going very very well um, as part of the uh, renovation um, and uh, restoration of the property my client uh, had to upgrade the various um, uh, mechanical and uh, uh, other systems on the property, including the HVAC systems. Um, on the existing conditions plan that was submitted with the application, um, you'll note that in the space between the two buildings, there are um, there were existing um, HVAC utility stands. Um, there were, uh, there still are two that are servicing the neighboring property, the, the law firm next door, um, and there was one that was serving this building. Um, my client uh, earlier this year went before the HDC and obtained a administrative approval to site and install a bank of HVAC units to support mini splits that would provide modern air conditioning amenities for guests at the inn um, in this uh, in the side yard, the left side yard. Um, in reliance on that uh, approval, 
the um, uh, my client had the uh, the units actually installed when the install was ongoing the installer um, informed my client that a seventh unit would be necessary to properly um, power the the, the uh, project um, so a seventh unit um, was uh, approval for a seventh unit was sought from the HTC at that point my client believing that we were just going to get another administrative approval um, learned for the first time that in fact where these are cited is in the side yard setback and a variance is required so six of them were installed in uh, uh, in reliance on the HDC approval. The seventh was installed, assuming we would get the administrative approval, um, which is basically the same thing as was previously asked for. Um, but at that point, it was determined by planning staff that variances were necessary. So we are here um, requesting two things. Uh, first, the necessary variances to uh, permit the uh, the units that are currently installed and in, in place um, to stay right where they are um, and in the alternative if for some reason the variances are not granted an equitable waiver from the dimensional requirements um, and the reason is really very simple um, the setback is impossible to meet in this case unless the, we were to cite uh, all of these units behind the building and there are many, many reasons why that's not appropriate. First of all, it, to do that would be an enormous expense to my client given what's already been installed. But I think more fundamentally, if we were to do that, it would, uh, it would be very prejudicial to the existing parking layout that we obtained conditional use permits uh, to allow. Um, and we also believe the HDC would be very unhappy with uh, us because that would be a much more visible uh, location for these units. Um, the guests coming in the rear entryway would be going by banks of um, HVAC mini split units. Um, and again, uh, we would likely lose or at least uh, have some impact on the parking configuration in the rear of the property. So it's really not an acceptable solution to um, to cite these somewhere behind the property. But that's the only place we could meet a 10-foot setback um, to cite mechanical units. Um, the, where they're cited now is on the left side of the building. Um, the left side of the building at its closest point to the side uh, boundary is less than five feet. In the CD4L1 zone, there is a general five-foot side yard setback. So the building itself doesn't meet that. Any mechanical units that go um, next to the building wouldn't meet that. It's, it's just an impossibility. We can't site mechanical units in front of the building or on the Mark Street um, side of the building because that's not permitted under the ordinance. So we need this relief. Um, I don't think it's a very, a very uh, large ask. The area that we are looking to site or we're looking for approval for siting these units is the space between the two buildings. This is not usable space for any other significant purpose. Um, light air access um, to, between the buildings is not materially affected. There were already um, mechanical units servicing either building um, in this area. Um, this 12-foot area between the buildings. So um, we think it's really a very modest request under all the circumstances. So with that as a backdrop, I'll just go through the variance criteria. Granting the variance will not be contrary to the spirit um, and intent of the ordinance, nor will it be contrary to the public interest. Here you have to decide whether or not the essential characteristics of the neighborhood would be altered by granting the relief or if there would be any uh, negative impact on the health safety and welfare of the public. Nothing is going to change in the neighborhood 
nobody's going to know that these are there. They're already installed. Uh, part of the approval we got from the HDC included a condition that there be some proper landscaping and screening, which my client is committed to doing. Um, so uh, those criteria are met um, by granting the variance. Um, substantial justice would be done by granting the variance. Here you have to balance the loss to the applicant against some gain to the general public if you were to require strict compliance with the ordinance. Um, in this case, there's no benefit to the public um, in denying the variance that is not grossly outweighed by the prejudice to uh, uh, the applicant. Uh, again, the corridor between these two buildings has been the site of HVAC units um, for several years. Um, these units were uh, approved, at least the first six units were approved by the uh, HDC. We anticipate getting the administrative approval for the seventh. Um, the, uh, uh, the fact that the HDC has to approve these um, is further evidence that um, the public interest is protected. Um, and uh, as I discussed, there's no other reasonable location on the site um, where we can put these. Putting them behind the building is just not an option. Um, special conditions associated with the property um, prevent it from, uh, um, prevent it from being used and under the strict terms of the zoning ordinance constitute an unnecessary hardship. Um, here we have a historic structure that has been approved for use as an inn. Um, in order for us to use it as an inn, modern travelers expect modern amenities, including modern air conditioning and heating. That's what this is, um, uh, what this proposal will facilitate. Um, the corridor between these two buildings is not uh, suitable for any other use. Um, so there is a hardship associated with the uh, property um, that uh, renders it so that it's unnecessary that um, we uh, fully comply with the ordinance. Um, the use is a reasonable one. Um, the uh, use of the property as an inn has been approved by this board, um, and this is just an amenity that one would expect uh, to go with um, an inn. Um, and then there's no fair and substantial relationship between the purpose of the ordinance and its application to this particular property. As I stated, the building itself is already within the five-foot uh, five side yard setback um, applicable in the CD4L1 zone. Um, there's no way to comply with the, uh, the larger setback that is applicable to um, to uh, mechanical units uh, under the circumstances of this property. And then finally, there's no diminution in value um, uh, on account of granting the variance uh, as, uh, as it's applied to other properties in the vicinity. Um, quite to the contrary, this is a, a substantial upgrade to this property. Um, none of the neighbors is opposed. Um, I discussed this with Chuck Doliak at length, and he's in full support. Um, and uh, he's the only really affected neighbor. If we were to uh, be forced to site the units to the rear of the property, um, that would actually have a more detrimental effect on the neighbors, in my opinion, because now these units would be, you know, very unsightly and be visible to the neighboring properties along Mark Street and behind us. Um, so that is the variance uh, pitch, so to speak. Um, I can get into the equitable waiver, or if you want to just vote on the variance, and I'll come back up. If Let's see how this goes. I, would be my recommendation. Thank you, okay. Madam Chair. And I'm happy to take any questions. Are there questions? Yeah, sorry. Yes, Mr. Rossi. So uh, just a couple for clarification. All seven units have now been installed, or the seventh unit is pending? No, no, they've, they've all been installed. And the first six units were installed before anyone realized that a variance would be needed. That's correct. But the seventh unit was installed after you knew that a variance was needed. No, no. So the seventh unit was, we had the installer there. He told us essentially 
you're, you're one shy, you're going to need another one. While he was there, they had him install that unit, applied for the administrative approval at the HDC. That's when it got flagged that all of them need, that all of them are within the offensive setback. Thank you. Ah. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, going up to page 156, so like uh, two pages up from what you're showing right now. Um, so there were two pre prior um, air condensers along the side of the building. Is this what the picture in the lower left-hand corner is showing us? Oh. Um, is that the one you? Yeah. No. There, it's circled in red. Yeah, circling. It's sorry. So it's one of the pictures. Oh. Yeah, one more. So the, these one more. photos that you're looking you at were part of the submissions to the historic <clears throat> district commission. Yeah. So my question on this page right here is the two that are circled. Um, presuming those, I, clearly one's a condenser. I'm presuming the other one's a condenser. Are those gone now? Yes. Okay. And as far as any research that between you and city staff never discovered that there was a variance that, that was granted for either for those either. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. It's possible that they, there should have been, but, you know, my experience has been often, and, and I'm not laying this up my client, but my experience has been people will have these mini splits installed without going through the right channels. I mean, it just happens all the time. Sure. And I, I guess, I mean, it's not your responsibility to see, but there's obviously too many splits up on the neighboring property. We don't know if those yep. also got a variance. but. Um, the one final question I would have, if I may, Madam Chair, is was there anything that your installer indicated for a technical reason why moving it behind the building would be an issue, like length of pipe runs or anything along those lines? Was there any discussion with the – with the? Yeah. Yeah. So that's another complicating factor is that, like, technically you probably couldn't even put them back there if you wanted to. Um, apparently that is the case. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I just, I don't have a question. Um, okay. So I think I would just say if uh, I would move to deal with this as a variance application. Okay. And then if for some reason it fails, we can go on to a Yes, that was my yeah. suggestion as well. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone to speak in favor of this petition? Anyone to speak in opposition? Or two for and against? The public hearing is closed. So would we like to deal with this as a variance? Why would we deal with it as a variance instead of a uh, equitable waiver for all seven units? We do either. Because it seems we to can do either. It seems to fit the equitable waiver. Can I sorry. Um, so both options have different implications uh, the applicant has applied for a variance um, I would suggest assessing that first and then if, if you find that it doesn't pass then going to the equitable waiver because that is the procedure that's been requested by the applicant is, <laughs> I, I just like can I contribute? I, based on what's been presented by the applicant, I don't know whether we've got what we need for an equitable waiver, but it looks like we do for a variance. That's just a. I'm sorry. You think it should be a? <clears throat> I I don't know what it should be, but I, 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 the presentation. On, well, nice. We can bring the applicant back up, but the presentation didn't hit the equitable waiver criteria. No, because yeah. we said that we would deal with, with just this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And if you feel that you would like to do that, then we can discuss this as a variance, mm -hmm. as we yeah. have with other things that have been put in place prior to them coming to us. If you do not want to do that, we will close the variance discussion and ask the petitioner come up again. I would say we should take the most direct path we can. I think, I'm, I'm okay. down with the variance. So is there anyone yeah. who would yeah. like to make a motion? I'm going with the variance. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You want to help? 
Yes, Ms. Murchison. I move that we um, uh, approve the variances as presented and advertised. And if I get a second, I will go to the criteria. I'll second. Thank you. Ms. Okay, thank you. Matson. So um, taking the first two um, in, in together, uh, 10.233.21 and 10.233.22 granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest uh, and it would observe the spirit of the ordinance I find that it meets that criteria um, as the applicant has noted um, there does not alter the essential character of the neighborhood there are um, no health safety and welfare issues the issue here really is the setback requirements for the left uh, left yard and the movement of air and light around the building um, I, I we find that the um, the location of the six uh, the location of the air conditioning the HVAC units uh, does not uh, implicate those concerns um, and I oh wait I just let me just ask Steph something quickly <coughs> I did not do we have to do the after fact variance for the six and then the variance for the sec seventh I that take. was my suggestion, but if you want to take them all at once. Okay, okay, so I'll just amend the motion to say that we're going to approve the variances for the six after the fact and for the, the seventh to be to be installed. Okay. So if that's both, okay with the yeah. both variance requests one and two are in your motion. Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, moving on to the next uh, criteria is granting the variance would do substantial justice, ten point two three three point two three. Um, we find yes, uh, there is no benefit to the public from um, from uh, for denying this public and uh, this variance request, and it would be a tremendous injustice to the applicant. Um, and then the fourth thing, the fourth criteria is 10.233.24, granting the variance would not diminish the values of surrounding properties. We find yes, it would not diminish the. Uh, the um, sorry, the values of surrounding properties. These are seven HVAC units um, uh, in between buildings. And then last, 10.233.25. The little enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance will result in unnecessary hardship. The property has special conditions that distinguish it from other properties in the area. And owing to these special conditions, a fair and substantial relationship does not exist between the general public purposes of the ordinance provision and the specific application of that variance of that provision to the property and the proposed use is a reasonable one. We'll start with the easy part. The uh, proposed use is a reasonable one because it is um, providing HVAC to a proved in within the district. Um, the, uh, the special conditions of the property are that it is um, a very historic property um, the applicant has stated about the problems with uh, citing the HVAC units in the back of the in the back of the inn, um, and therefore I find that it has um, special conditions that do not um, relate to the public purpose of the ordinance as is applied to this property. Does the second have anything to add? I'll just add that it uh, they also couldn't be. Uh, Put on the other side or in front, so there's no other uh, location. I'll accept that. Okay. That's good. <laughs> All right. So there is a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion? Okay. A yes vote allows these uh, to exist. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Record. Yes. Mr. Mantle. Yes. Ms. Margerson. Yes. Mr. Rayum. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair vote. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You too. If there is no new business, then motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 I'll see you next Tuesday. And I think it was good to break this.